The prophet Joseph Smith said that happiness is the object and the design of our existence and will be the result thereof if we but walk the pathway which leads to it. And that pathway, said he, is virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping of all the commandments of God. Happiness is the object and the design of our existence. The happiness is the object and design of our existence. Happiness is the object and design of our existence. Happiness is the object and design of our existence. Happiness is the object and design of our existence. Happiness. 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 Happiness is the object and the design of our existence, and will be the end thereof if we will but pursue the path which leads to it. And that path is virtue. 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 Uprightness. 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 Faithfulness. 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 Holiness. 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 And keeping all of the commandments of God. 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 The prophet Joseph declared, happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. What you just heard was several references from official conversations. You likely recognize the voice of Dallin H. Oaks and uh, even more specifically Thomas S. Monson in those audio bites. There were several apostles and presidents of the church whose voices you heard there as well as other auxiliary leaders and members of the 70. The happiness letter has been quoted in Mormonism a multitude of times. The quote is often used to point us to what it takes to be happy and that sacrifices must be made. But what is not said is the manipulative context of this letter authored by the prophet Joseph Smith. In today's episode, you're going to hear a conversation that consists mainly of Jonathan Streeter and Chris Smith, with just a few comments here and there by me. We go into depth about the happiness letter and the attempted manipulation of Nancy Rigdon into an illicit relationship. My challenge to you as listeners as you listen to today's episode is that simply reading the happiness letter is insufficient to give you the context needed to understand this issue. If you follow this episode back to where it was posted at mormondiscussionpodcast.org or mdpodcast.org. If you find this episode, look at the show notes, follow all of the hyperlinks and sources. What you'll come to understand is that LDS leaders in the early 1840s, late 1830s and early 1840s were deeply teaching in the background manipulative theology designed to convince women to become plural wives of various members of the church, specifically the prophet Joseph Smith, often for the purpose of sexuality. I hope you enjoy today's episode, but I don't think it's one that's going to be very comfortable. And with that, now onto what you've been waiting to hear. Welcome to another episode of Mormon Discussion Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Real, and I'm sitting here today with Jonathan Streeter, and Chris Smith. How are you guys this morning? Doing great. Doing great. Good, good. Glad to have you both on. So I was at Sunstone. You guys were at Sunstone. Somebody canceled at the last minute, and you guys presented on the happiness letter from Nancy Rigdon. And I've always wanted to understand this story better, so I went into your, your session, sat uh, through what I thought was a really great presentation, especially last minute. I thought it was something, it, it sounded like something had been prepared over a long period of time. Uh, I want to I wanna give you guys just a brief moment to introduce yourselves to the audience, but then let's jump into the early life of Nancy Rigdon and uh, go from there. That sounds good. Chris, you want to start? Sure. I'm Christopher Smith. I've got a PhD in religion from Claremont Graduate University. I uh, have taught at uh, Utah State and been a fellow at BYU. Um, and basically, I'm, I'm a, an American historian of religion, but specializing in Mormonism. And I'm John Streeter. I run the blog Thoughts on Things and Stuff and the YouTube channel Thinker of Thoughts. 
you know, I grew up in the church, ended up going a different direction a few years ago, but fell in love with church history and just the study of the phenomenon of what it is that makes people love the church so much. And so it's been the subject of a lot of my blog and podcast activities. And the happiness letter in particular is something that's been on my mind for several years. And you're right, Bill. Uh, you didn't see us just come up with this last minute when it canceled. This is something that I've been talking to Chris about for a while. We had some things in the works and it just was serendipity that there was an opportunity for us to showcase it at Sunstone. Hey, I found it amazing that you guys, again, last minute, it wasn't on the schedule that everybody had in their hands. And yet that was a, that was a room that had a lot of people in it. And I thought it was just an interesting conversation. So with that, let's start off Nancy Rigdon, uh, maybe start us wherever you want to, and let's run through here, and, and I'll poke in and ask a question here and there. Okay, well, I just want to kind of give a, an outline of this. This is all going to center around something that we'll refer to as the Nancy Rigdon Affair, and that happens in 1842. But if you really want to understand it, you have to go back and you have to start a lot earlier than 1842. So we're going to take some time and just take a look at Nancy Rigdon's biography, where she came from. We're going to look at some of the rumors that were swirling around Joseph Smith's prior accusations of sexual impropriety. We're going to look at the things that are going on in 1842 when we get there that help you understand both the events around the letter and the contents of the letter itself, and then what happens with the letter, and then some of the aftermath of it. I just want to start with where did Nancy Rigdon first meet Joseph Smith? And if you study church history, you know a little bit of the history where the church was founded in 1830, I believe. Uh, that year, Parley P. Pratt used to be a congregant member of Sidney Rigdon and ended up joining the church and then going on a mission and sharing the Book of Mormon with Sidney Rigdon. The story goes that he initially rejected it, but then ended up reading it and becoming converted to it. Uh, does that sound about right, Chris? That was Parley Pratt. And in fact, if anybody would like to know more about that story, they can read about it in my article, Playing Lamanite, that appeared in the journal Mormon History. <laughs> oh, excellent. All right. He was uh, baptized pretty closely, his whole family. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, the Rigdon family. Yeah. So and Nancy would have been eight years old around that time. And we can kind of start the relationship between the Rigdon family, Nancy as the oldest daughter in particular, in 1830, where she would have been an eight-year-old child uh, baptized. Now, it's, if I understand correctly, Joseph Smith was not the one who baptized the Rigdon family. Um, do you know who it was that did the baptism, Chris? I'm not sure, but it was one of those missionaries, Parley Pratt, Oliver Cowdery, Ziba Peterson, and I don't remember who the last one was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then if you kind of do a search for, you know, what are the other connections between Joseph and Nancy directly, you can find a letter in the Joseph Smith Papers Project where Joseph is writing about some of his experiences visiting the saints in Kirkland, and he mentions visiting the Rigdon family and specifically blessing Nancy. And so Joseph Smith would have visited, and this is a year later, a nine-year-old uh, Nancy Rigdon who was fallen ill and laid his hands on her and given her a blessing. And that's the first time that I can find that there's a real physical connection between the two. Going forward, Chris, as part of his presentation, gave uh, an account that there were some rumors going around that Joseph had had some interaction with uh, Rigdon's family, and I'll let Chris kind of talk about that. Sure. So uh, this is in 1838, and uh, there's a guy named William C. Smith who later becomes a member of the RLDS Church. This is not the prophet's brother, different William Smith. But he testified in 1884 that he thought that Joseph Smith had been interested in Nancy at Kirtland. And he says, my impression is that the report was here in Kirtland. I went to school with Athelia Rigdon, that's Nancy's one year younger sister, and there was talk among the boys about sealing. I think there was difficulty between Joseph Smith and Rigdon with reference to having Rigdon's daughter sealed to Smith. I would not positively say it was so. That is my impression. So ordinarily, a source like this, I would just dismiss because it's a really late reminiscence. He says he's not even sure about it. And it sounds like something where he could be confusing later events from Nauvoo with the Kirtland era. But there, in this case, is contemporary corroboration. So we have a letter by Oliver Cowdery's brother, Warren Cowdery, that he published in the Latter-day Saints Messenger and Advocate in September 1837. And he alludes to these rumors about Joseph Smith and a daughter of Sidney Rigdon. Uh, 
He says he's heard that rumors were afloat and had gained some credence in your towns, these are neighboring towns around Kirtland, that were derogatory to the characters of Joseph Smith Jr. and the family of Sidney Rigdon. He called these rumors a sheer fabrication and said that Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon are still on friendly terms, so these rumors apparently were implying some kind of falling out between Joseph and Sidney. And he doesn't spell out exactly what the rumors were, but in his closing sentence, he makes it pretty clear that it related to Joseph Smith's involvement with a Rigdon daughter, because he says, relative to the family of Sidney Rigdon, we have to say that it is large, consisting mostly of females, young, innocent, unsuspecting, without reproach, and for aught we know, above suspicion. So these rumors apparently involve some kind of sexual misconduct between Joseph Smith and a, a Rigdon daughter, and uh, we don't know which Rigdon daughter, so... Uh, in the Nauvoo sources, we don't have any indication that there had been prior involvement between Joseph and Nancy. Um, it kind of seems like this came out of left field for Nancy, so there's a real possibility that the uh, person involved in these Kirtland rumors was actually Nancy's sister, Athalia, who, uh, when Joseph Smith comes to talk to the Rigdon family about the letter that he sent to Nancy in Nauvoo, uh, Athalia sort of leaps to his defense when Nancy accuses him. So possibly there was some kind of prior involvement uh, between Joseph and Athalia. But, you know, this is, this is pretty thin. We don't know exactly what the nature of the rumors were. Maybe this was just Joseph Smith had noticed Nancy or Athalia and sort of said something improper or, you know, uh, looked at them the wrong way and rumors circulated. So we don't really know. Okay. And for me, the, the big takeaway from that is that, you know, there was some sort of rumor in the air that there had been some connection between Joseph and one of the daughters of Sidney Rigdon. And that fits in with a pattern of accusations that kind of plagued Joseph as he moved along in the development of the early church. And there's a document out there authored by former CES instructor Grant Palmer, where he looked at all of the early accusations of sexual impropriety of Joseph Smith, and he's documented all of them. And check that document out, and when you read it, you can see the types of allegations which seemed to follow Joseph no matter where he went. And one of those occurred in 1832, and it has some significance for what ultimately happens with the Nancy Rigdon affair in 1842. And that is when Joseph and Emma were living with the Johnson family in Kirtland. And we all know if we grew up in the church that there's this story of Joseph Smith being dragged from the house and tarred and feathered. And it's one of those stories that's frequently brought out just to show how persecuted Joseph was for preaching the gospel, for bringing the restoration of the truth, and how he was hated by everyone for that. But when you actually dig into the history and look at the accounts of the people involved in that event, you can find out that it's a little bit more complex than that, as many of these things are. And that is that not only did they tar and feather him, but they also had a doctor on hand who was ready to castrate Joseph. And the story goes that once they had Joseph laid out on a board and called on the doctor to do his procedure, he decided that he was not going to do it. But the people who gave an account of this event indicate that one of the Johnson boys, the reason the doctor was there to castrate him was because there was a sexual impropriety that is linked with Joseph and one of Johnson's daughters, a girl by the name of Marinda, who was 16 years old at the time. Joseph was in his mid to late 20s. I think he was around 27 at that time with Emma living with the Johnsons. And there was this rumor that he had been inappropriate or had pursued Marinda Johnson, who was the 16-year-old daughter of the family he was living with. Any other details on that, Chris, that I may have messed out? Yeah, I think uh, an important piece of context for this is that 1832 is uh, when Orson Pratt says Joseph Smith first told people about polygamy. Uh, Pratt says that Joseph told people the principle of taking more wives than one is a true principle, but the time had not yet come for it to be practiced. So this is potentially when that principle is emerging. And the same year, Joseph Smith revises Romans 7 for the Joseph Smith translation, the inspired version of the Bible. And in Romans 7, in which Paul is talking about how Christians aren't under the law anymore, Joseph writes, For the good that I would have done when under the law, I find not to be good, therefore I do it not. But the evil which I would not do under the law, I find to be good, that I do. So it's kind of calling 
good evil and evil good. It's kind of reversing the, the standard moral paradigm, which is very much the kind of rhetorical move that he makes in the happiness letter, which we'll discuss later. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Now we're leading up to the events of 1842. We've talked about uh, the connections between Joseph and the Rigdon family. Uh, we've talked about all of these different events that seem to link Joseph to unorthodox sexual practices that are just plaguing him as he goes through there. You've got, of course, the Fanny Alger affair. There's other stories that I'll refer you to that Grant Palmer document. Then we get to Nauvoo in 1842. Now, before we get here, just reflect back on the history of the Rigdon family and the Smith family. By the time they're in Nauvoo, we've been through the Ohio Kirtland era and all of the conflicts about that. What would you say would be the major landmarks between the Rigdon family and Joseph along this time, Chris? Were they always on good terms? I, I think for the most part, they were on pretty good terms. I mean, Rigdon is basically the, the number two man in the church. He's uh, helping Joseph Smith run the church. So they Especially during Missouri, Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon are hand in glove. Okay, so so Nancy is really seeing her father not only um, as a co-leader of the church, but also share in some of the tribulations of Joseph and, you know, certainly receive the benefit of being in Joseph's inner circle. What I want to do is, is have the listener kind of just get a sense of if you're the teenage daughter of somebody who's the right-hand man of the prophet— what kind of social pressures or familial pressures would you have of rejecting somebody who you had seen as your benefactor? Um, because all of these things are in the air and must press upon her mind. So when you see what type of young woman Nancy is in this situation, it kind of makes you feel even more impressed with what her character is when we actually get into it. So... 1842, uh, particularly early 1842, is one of the most momentous periods of time in the church. In January, you've got Joseph Smith opening up his red brick store, the upstairs room of which sees a bunch of really historic events. You've got the creation of the Relief Society in March. You've got the elevation of Joseph Smith and others to the position of Master Mason, I believe, in the newly formed Nauvoo Freemasonry Lodge there. You've got the, you know, shortly after that, the creation and introduction of the temple endowment. And underneath all of this is Joseph's activities in creating his network of people who are all involved in the practice of polygamy. It's around early 1842 where Heber C. Kimball has been put to the Abrahamic test already. You know, first Joseph asserts that he wants Violet Kimball and Heber struggles with that, finally consents, and then Joseph says it was just a test. And then shortly after that, Heber is brought into polygamy. He originally says, well, why don't I just marry these old spinsters? And Joseph says, no, you need to marry Sarah Noon, I believe, who is a younger woman. And so all of these things are happening, which if they're happening behind the scenes, you can understand why Joseph and other leaders are having to deal with this constant flood of rumors that something, you know, something unorthodox is happening. This is why in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, you'll find section 101 that is trying to put to rest rumors and accusations that polygamy is happening. You know, if there was nothing to cause these rumors, there'd be no reason for them to be so outright in, in denying those rumors. So clearly, some of this stuff is leaking out into the air and people are, are realizing that something is up. One of the things to also realize is that Joseph and Emma have house guests. Um, it's hard to piece all these things together, but when you go back and look at the dates, at in early 1842, the Partridge sisters are living with Joseph and Emma. And years later in the Temple Lot case, Emily Partridge would say that Joseph told her that he had something to tell her that would place him at risk and that he would be willing to write a letter if she would read it and then burn it. And so we're starting to see that there's a pattern that we're going to recognize when we get to the Nancy Rigdon affair proper. Now, 1842, particularly in March and early April of 1842, saw several interesting things that are interesting primarily in retrospect. Let's talk about a few of them. Okay, so March 24th, 1842, the Relief Society has already been formed. It was, it was formed the 17th. On the second meeting, Joseph Smith files a complaint against Clarissa Marvel, 
and basically says that she is spreading lies about him. And you can go to the Joseph Smith Papers website, look at the Relief Society Minute Books, and you can see the discussions that are had about Clarissa Marvel. Essentially, Clarissa Marvel had been living with Agnes Smith for a year, and Agnes Smith was the widow of Joseph's brother, Don Carlos. And she was spreading rumors that there was some sort of inappropriate relationship between Joseph Smith and Agnes. And so if you go and look at the minutes, you can see that Joseph is basically calling her a liar for spreading lies about him. And there's a great deal of consternation in the Relief Society because they're trying to root out anyone who is trying to disparage the leaders of the church. They eventually send some people to talk to her, and the people they send happen to also be in Joseph's polygamy circle. And then a few meetings later, she has affixed her name to a statement that says, I've never seen or said anything bad about Joseph at all. But looking back, we can see that Joseph actually had in January of that year, secretly taken Agnes as a plural wife. So what we're starting to see here is that there's a difference between what the leaders are saying publicly and what they're doing privately. And that contrast between what is publicly said and what is being done privately is very important when you look at everything around the happiness letter and the Nancy Rigdon affair, because when you examine other groups where the leaders are using their position to take advantage of people in the congregation, you'll find the same pattern of something different said publicly, uh, particularly to outsiders of the group, but even to insiders of the group, and then what is happening privately. There's another instance in, in March 31st. This is one of probably the most fascinating things that I think gives us some insight into Emma Smith. In the midst of all of this, Joseph and several other leaders of the church write a letter to the Relief Society telling them that they need to learn how to keep secrets. And they use the pattern of secrecy of the Freemasons to do that. And when you read the minutes of the Relief Society, you can see that one of the things that they're concerned with doing is taking any bad news about the leadership of the church and keeping quiet about that, but talking about good stuff. So there's already an aura of secrecy happening. But then Joseph Smith in this letter specifically says that no prophet, seer, revelator, apostle, or anyone can use his name or use their position to teach or preach anything that varies from morality, from virtue, from any of the the conventional standards of, of marriage. Sexual relations are only within the bonds of marriage. And this this letter that Emma Smith reads in the Relief Society is interesting for one particular reason, and that is that we have two copies of the content of the letter. One of the copies is what is written in the minutes of the Relief Society, which is what Emma actually verbally said to the Relief Society. And the other copy of the letter is what the letter actually contained, which they kept the letter and Joseph Smith Papers Project has scanned that letter. And a few years back, I was I was checking out that letter and I decided to do a textual comparison on it. And I noticed that there was a particular line that is in the letter that Emma Smith specifically left out of the letter. And, and that line is very, very telling because that part of the letter, it says, um, you know, we warn you and forewarn you in the name of the Lord to check and destroy any faith that any person may have in any character, for we do not want anyone to believe anything as coming from us, meaning the leaders of the church, Joseph in particular, contrary to old established morals and virtues and scriptural laws regulating the habits, customs, and conduct of society. That's what Emma read to the to the Relief Society. But when you look at the original letter, what it actually says is, don't believe anything as coming from us, contrary to the old established morals, virtues, scriptural laws, re- regulating the habits, customs, and conduct of faith, unless it be by message delivered to you by our own mouth, by actual revelation and commandment. That last part about unless it's delivered to you by our own mouth, by actual revelation and commandment, Emma left that out when she was reading the letter to the Relief Society. And you can see why, because that is a loophole which basically instructs every there to 
reject any variation from established morals and virtues unless it comes directly from Joseph by revelation and commandment. And that is very key because when we read the happiness letter, that concept of unorthodox, new, or contrary things coming by actual revelation and commandment is exactly what it's focused on. Let, let me stop you for just a second, uh, John. Yeah. Um, so I want to I wanna talk about that for a moment, which is this idea, maybe speculate or, or give us your thoughts on Emma's motives when you say like, okay, the leaders of the church, Joseph Smith, are inserting like, hey, we always follow kind of the standard cultural morality unless there is some kind of secret instruction given. And then Emma, when she goes to give this instruction, completely leaves that out, knowing essentially that it's a loophole. Is it because, I, I guess I could see a couple motives, which is that one, she senses like that's a loophole, or two, she's actually helping Joseph to keep this initiative, which is if I, I guess, I guess I don't know. I'm trying to, I guess I'm trying to push you back and see if what you would say about Emma's mindset at this moment and why she would receive instruction going one way and then give it in another. Yeah, I, I think it's a really complicated picture. When you read those early minutes of the Relief Society and you see what is written as coming from President Smith, in the Relief Society notes that's referring to Emma Smith, and the other women, there's this real strong mentality that they're trying to root out iniquity, they're trying to find and root out these people who are spreading lies or are actually involved in this spiritual wifery thing. You know, it depends on how much inside knowledge Emma has about what's actually going on. My sense from my exposure so far is that she is not aware of the full extent of it, and but has some reservations and sees that there may be some. Uh, I think there's one point that say there may be more truth than poetry in what's being described about Joseph Smith. And so anything that she can do in her domain to try to seal and, and put a lid on that, both spreading the news of it as well as the possibility of it, I would see her doing. I don't know if you have a different take on it, Chris. I think Emma was aware of what Joseph Smith was doing with polygamy and extramarital affairs, and they had had conversations about it already, and that she essentially used her position in the Relief Society to sort of wage a guerrilla war against the private teachings that he was promulgating to people. She's using her authority to try to oppose his authority. Yeah. Yeah, it's it seems like there's enough smoke everywhere. I mean I mean she's been dealing with this at this point by four or five years of hearing allegations, you know, on a regular basis. And so there has to be so much smoke in her mind that, that she realizes to some extent something's going on. Yeah, I don't have the uh, source in front of me, so I don't remember who it was. But there was, I think it might have been William E. McClellan who said that uh, Emma told him explicitly that she knew for a fact that Joseph Smith had had extramarital affairs for years uh, prior to the uh, revelation, the polygamy revelation, DNC 132. So she was aware of this for quite some time. Yeah. All right. So that letter was read on March 31st. So um, they're already kind of setting up these things. And that focus on whether or not special revelation or commandment comes directly from Joseph becomes important later. So just kind of put that on your on your shelf for a minute. Okay, so we move along then. Then we've got something happening on April 7th. Now, this is two days before the story of the Nancy Rigdon affairs. But on April 7th, there's a special conference. We have the conference notes for it. Hiram Smith and Joseph stand up and speak before the congregation. One of the things that they are doing is trying to put to rest rumors about a young woman who had been locked away in a room with leaders of the church, Brigham Young, Heber Kimball, trying to persuade her to accept the principle of plural wives. Hiram stands up and says, you know, we got to put these rumors to rest. Joseph stands up and says, you know, nobody who is familiar with us would believe any of these stories. It's a waste of time to even talk about it. And what all of these things are alluding to is the story of Martha Brotherton. And that's something that is a whole separate podcast in and of itself, but it establishes this pattern where leaders of the church, there are rumors of it anyway, isolating young women and using the force of their rhetoric, the force of their religious position, and the isolation of the women to compel them to accept these unorthodox ideas that are against the conventional morals of the day with the idea that 
leaders of the church are giving special permission, special revelation. This idea of the blessings of Jacob is reiterated in these stories. And we're going to see that what is happening in the Nancy Rigdon affair exactly mirrors what these rumors are. By the way, um, I'm just looking at Mormon polygamy documents, which I believe is Brian Hales, right? Right. There's an affidavit from Martha Brotherton. I'm not going to read through it right here, but is there any mention of her being locked up. I mean, besides the rumors that they're addressing, we don't know what the rumors specifically are. We just know they're addressing and putting them down. We've got John C. Bennett's expose. Is there, is there any other concrete statements out there that point to this incident actually happening with Martha Brotherton? I would say the other concrete thing is that later when Martha Brotherton dies, Brigham Young has her sealed to him. That is kind of the the punctuation of the idea that there was some connection between Brigham Young and Martha Brotherton. Gotcha. Yeah. This just shows you that the leaders, even up to Joseph himself, up to two days before what happens with the Nancy Rigdon affair, are outright denying that anything at all other than conventional monogamy, conventional marriage, conventional morals is taught or practiced by the church. And this will become even more important later when all of the women who had been seduced by John C. Bennett and others start giving testimony before the high council. But right now we're at the time period where all of that is is actually going on before anything is really blown up majorly about it. Uh, let, Let me ask a question here. Yes. So the April 7th incident, essentially you have John C. Bennett who is saying, who, who starts this rumor, right? He's the one who initiates this kind of conversation. This is occurring. No, I, I want to correct that because when everybody finds out about it and when it's in the, the full public mind, that is when John C. Bennett has started to write his expose, his letters to the San Gamo Journal. That actually happens in July later. So us in the future, we see all that and we see it kind of blown apart because of Bennett's public exposés. But this is early, early, early before Bennett is still, he still has not been ousted. He hasn't written those letters yet. And so this is just the rumors that are going on because Bennett was not the first person to let these stories go out in the public. They were in the air at the time. Gotcha. That's important because I know that Fair Mormon makes it like, okay, it's John C. Bennett's word against Joseph and Hiram. And you already see in what Joseph and Hiram do in addressing these, addressing at this conference or at this meeting is they're saying, look, we're not even practicing anything outside monogamy. Don't trust these rumors. The fact that they are doing things outside monogamy already lends some distrust to their credibility on what they're saying. And Fair Mormon makes it sound like it's essentially an argument against John C. Bennett. But as you're pointing out, this rumor is already in the cultural milieu. John C. Bennett then picks up and runs with it. But it's really Joseph and Hiram being dishonest about the sole practice of monogamy and locking girls up in rooms trying to convince them of polygamy, juxtaposed against uh, a multitude of people who are now hearing these whispers of these events happening. Yeah. And, and the thing is, the word game that they're going to play with is that these were carefully worded denials. The thing is, when you look at the what Joseph and others are saying, they're not trying to play word games. They're saying, basically, we don't do anything other than straight up monogamy. And that, you know, we don't practice anything that even people would mistake for that. When when you see the contents of the happiness letter, when you reflect back now that the church has admitted that there's polygamy going on, what they're doing is very much close to what is brought up in connection with John C. Bennett and the others that are doing the spiritual wifery thing. Yeah, so I just want the listeners to understand that there is a plethora of things going on behind the scenes that people are catching wind of of inappropriate propositions to various women, including young girls, and that as these events are happening, rumors are getting out. And as these rumors spread, Joseph, Hiram, other leaders of the church are trying to say, look, look, don't believe that. Trust the prophet. Trust his credibility. But when you say like, hey, we're just practicing monogamy, you've already taken a serious dent to your credibility. And maybe, and and, and likely, those rumors are true. Yeah. Yeah. As we're learning later. Okay, so we've talked about connections between Joseph and the Rigdom family. We've talked about early sexual improprieties accused at Joseph Smith leading up to 1842. We've talked about all of the events of 1842, including major doctrinal revelations of the endowment and so forth. And we've talked about the secret actions of the leaders being different from their public denials. There's one more piece of this puzzle that we have to fit in before we get to this remarkable funeral that happens on April 9th. And that is 
what I call the manipulation and exploitation of Marinda Johnson Hyde. And so you remember in 1832, when Joseph was almost castrated, it was because of accusations about improprieties with Marinda. Well, later on, she marries Orson Hyde, who is an apostle. And in 1841, Orson Hyde is sent off on a mission to the Holy Land. And at that time, Marinda has, I believe, three young daughters. She's kind of left destitute and on her own. In the winter of 1841, she goes to Joseph and talks about her position, Joseph considers it and has the first of several convenient revelations. Now, at that time, he receives a revelation that God commands Mirinda to be taken into the household of a family in Nauvoo called the Robinson family, Ebenezer Robinson at the head of that family. Now, Ebenezer Robinson is the printer, the publisher of the Times and Season, which is the newspaper for Nauvoo there. His family lives in an apartment above the print shop in the same building as the print shop. And Ebenezer Robinson has been approached already by the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles because they want him to sell the Times and Seasons um, to them so that they can have more control over what gets printed in the pages of the newspaper. Willard Richards is the apostle who's really heading that up. At one point, Willard Richards tells Ebenezer that if he doesn't sell, then he's going to start his own competing paper and put him out of business. But this is his life's calling. He he apprenticed at it, and, and that's what he wants to do. He's not interested in selling. But when Joseph has this revelation that he is to take Marinda and her daughters into his household and provide for them, he immediately does that. And that revelation did not simply include that. It also included some instructions to Marinda that uh, I think Chris does a good job of kind of laying out the power of those instructions. Yeah, so uh, the the revelation orders Ebenezer Robinson, who at the time is living in the church's printing office, uh, to open their doors and take uh, Nancy Marinda Hyde in, and her children into their house and take care of them. Uh, until Orson Hyde returns from his mission to Israel, where he was at the time. And then the letter, or the revelation goes on to say, And let my handmaid Nancy Marinda Hyde hearken to the counsel of my servant Joseph in all things whatsoever he shall teach unto her, and it shall be a blessing upon her and upon her children after her, unto her justification, saith the Lord. So she's being instructed to hearken to Joseph's counsel in all things that he teaches her, essentially to suspend thought. And he really does seem to have had Nancy Miranda Hyde completely under his control. And she does hearken to all things that he teaches her, including the uh, plural wife teaching. And she begins to help him recruit new plural wives. And it's in that capacity that she approaches Nancy. So that is going to be her role in this affair, is uh, introducing Nancy to uh, Joseph Smith uh, so that Joseph Smith can raise this proposal with her, uh, sexual and marital. Yeah, exactly. And, and remember, this is happening in December of 1841. Then the next month in January, you know, Ebenezer just took this young family into his house with his family. And then Joseph Smith has another convenient revelation. And his revelation is to the Twelve. And God commands them to purchase through any means necessary or through the way that God will reveal to them the print shop from Ebenezer Robinson. So now it's not just that the Twelve won it, it's that God is commanding the Twelve to obtain it. And so Ebenezer looks at the revelations. He's like, I'm not going to fight this. So he, he doesn't fight it. He goes ahead and consents to sell, but he gets to name his terms. And it is the apostle Willard Richards, who is very close with Joseph at this time and acting as his scribe. The apostle Willard Richards is the one who executes that contract. And this is happening on a very quick time frame in the middle of the winter. Ebenezer tries to find a place for his family to move to. He's not able to really arrange it because housing is really short at this time. But Willard Richards tells him, you know, basically by the end of tonight, the, the day they signed the contract, by the end of the tonight, if you're not out, I'm going to kick you out. And so Robinson finds a tiny corner in a neighbor's house that he can move his family into. But Marinda stays in the print shop that night. Who else but Willard Richards, Apostle Willard Richards, who is living by himself in Nauvoo because his wife, who he married when he was in England, stayed in Massachusetts and so he's, his wife is in Massachusetts. He's in Nauvoo. He moves in with Marinda Hyde, whose husband is in Jerusalem on the mission. And they are now cohabitating in the apartment above the print shop. 
the the story goes that Willard Richards boarded up the windows, went out into the streets and shot off his guns that night and started, <laughs> you got to love John C. Bennett's power with language at some point. Bennett describes this as Willard Richards notoriously hiding in these days. And, and so they're cohabitating. And if, and if you know about kind of just the way that society and culture is in that era, that is a scandalous thing and is undoubtedly to be the subject of rumor. But in February of 1842 now, we've set the stage. We've got Marinda living with Willard Richards above the print shop. And this is all important because when we get to Nancy Rigdon, you're going to see that these two figures are totally enmeshed in what goes on. Miranda has been told to obey Joseph in everything. And we're going to learn that she has been brought into the circle of polygamy. There's some speculation that there was an inappropriate sexual relation between Miranda and Willard at this time, both of them having their spouses outside of Nauvoo. We learn in Joseph Smith's journal, there's a little handwritten note that says that Joseph Smith was sealed to Marinda, and it just says April 1842. And so by the time we get to the events of the Nancy Rigdon affair, we have good evidence to support the idea that Marinda was an insider of polygamy, even one of Joseph's secret polyandrous wives. And this is where we approach uh, Nancy Rigdon. Now, I think we've set up all the all the story that you need to have. Is there anything that I missed, Chris, that you can think of that would be important to know? Yeah, let me just chip in and say that uh, Ebenezer Robinson, John C. Bennett, and Sidney Rigdon, all three say that uh, Willard was sexually involved with uh, Nancy Miranda Hyde, uh, which is interesting because she then marries Joseph Smith. So there's the question of was she ever sealed to Willard or were they merely sexually involved outside of marriage? Um, Joseph Smith at this time is teaching a doctrine of concubinage as well as a doctrine of plural marriage, which we'll get into uh, in a few minutes here. So it's possible that she was merely acting as a concubine to Willard Richards, but it's also possible Brigham Young later laid out this doctrine where uh, women could sort of trade up for a better priesthood holder. So it may be that she was sealed to Willard Richards and then trades up for Joseph Smith and gets sealed instead to Joseph Smith, which would have canceled the sealing to Richards. So we're not entirely sure what the nature of the relationship between Willard and Nancy was, but it seems to have been sexual. And uh, also, just to put a finer point on the Bennett's comment about Willard hiding in the printing office, it may not have been clear to all the listeners that that's a play on Nancy Miranda Hyde's last name. Yes. And I just want to just, just to throw out, as you guys were going through all of that, I was just looking at Martha Brotherton's affidavit, and she acknowledges in the document that... Uh, uh, Brigham Young locked the door uh, when they had the conversation in the upstairs, pulled the curtain, closed the window, pulled the curtain uh, as that conversation was happening. So we have the, the door being locked in Martha's own words. It's it's not just John C. Bennett or just rumors that we don't know about. Yeah, speaking, speaking also of uh, closing up windows, uh, I think Willard, when uh, Ebenezer Robinson says that Willard fired off his gun in the street, Robinson doesn't explain why Willard would have done that. But I think probably he did that in order to provide himself a pretense to move into the printing office, that he was there to defend the printing office. And uh, boarding up the windows would also be consistent with an alibi of trying to defend the printing office from thieves. But really, I mean, this is providing him privacy with Mrs. Hyde. Well, it does get, it does get messy when you dig into this, that's for sure. Um, all right, so we've built up all of these things, so hopefully you can understand what's going on. And then we get to the fateful day of the 9th of April, 1842. And there are other accounts of these events from Nancy's younger brother, John, that are much later. And so the details on that one are probably not as fresh. Before we get into this, Chris, what, what do you say about people that question the provenance of, of this narrative? How reliable is this part of John C. Bennett's story about what's going on? Well, Bennett is writing an expose, and so he always sensationalizes a little bit. And different versions of the stories uh, that he tells sometimes will have slightly different details. But overall, Bennett's stories are corroborated by lots of other sources. And so the people who simply wave their hand and dismiss Bennett out of hand just haven't done the background work to find out exactly how much of Bennett's stories are corroborated by other sources, frankly. I think he's a 
pretty good source actually overall. Yeah, and we have to kind of put a fine point on that is that one of the things that we only have from Bennett, and that is the text of the happiness letter was so considered to be reliable and authentic that the church internalized it in its in its documentary history, and it's been quoted in lesson manuals and conference talks. It was quoted as early as J. Golden Kimball quoted it in the 20th century, and we even have some quotes of concepts that are less recognizable in, in the 1800s. So very early on, the contemporaries of Joseph Smith recognized the letter as from him, and if you accept the letter, then you have to accept the context of what produced the letter. Now, there may be some points about exactly what was said when that there may be some differences of opinion on or doubt on, but the fact that there was a proposal and a rejection necessitating the letter and then the, the contents of the letter is really not in dispute. The people, both faithful and critical of the church, have to accept those things. And I don't want to get sidetracked here because John C. Bennett himself could be another podcast. But when I joined the church as, a, as an older teenager and I go through my early time in Mormonism, I am taught explicitly to distrust critical sources. And as I'm investigating the history of the church and reading, I'm coming across John C. Bennett's own practice of spiritual wifery and some of the things he was doing and being dishonest about. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but maybe just a little bit of commentary on parsing out John C. Bennett's practice and why the church lost trust in him or why Joseph Smith lost trust in him versus what seems to be the leadership of the church doing the same type of behaviors. We were always taught as believing Mormons that, you know, the spiritual wifery thing over here is bad and uh, polygamy over here is good. And I'm trying to figure out how much John C. Bennett was in with the leadership of the church doing the things they were doing and how much he was going rogue. Well, do you want to address that, Chris? What would you have to say about that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it really focuses on the concubinage doctrine and the sort of sex ring that gets busted open in May 1842. So that's happening basically contemporaneously with this Nancy Rigdon thing, that a number of sort of insiders, Joseph Smith's inner circle, are being tried for approaching women with uh, extramarital sexual proposals and telling them that it is okay to have sex outside of marriage. Uh, that God allows this. And Bennett is a ringleader in this. Of course, Joseph Smith is also a ringleader in this, but Bennett ends up being a convenient scapegoat uh, that all of this sort of gets pinned on. So I think that's part of it is just that Bennett makes a convenient scapegoat. But also, I think maybe Bennett is taking this a little bit farther. He, he's being indiscreet. He's getting caught. And that really is the cardinal sin here. And then also in the Nancy Rigdon affair, Bennett pushes back against Joseph Smith's proposal to Nancy Rigdon. Bennett actually warns her beforehand what Joseph Smith is planning to propose. And Bennett is uh, corresponding with her boyfriend, Francis Higby, about all of this. So I think that uh, Joseph Smith sees Bennett as a traitor. And we'll hear a little bit of that language as we tell this story. And I would add to that that we have the benefit now. I think Joseph Smith Papers Project has recently published the high council record of the testimony of the women who came forward that blew open the John C. Bennett affair. And to me, the most telling thing is that when you look at what the women say that was being told to them, one of the things that happens is they don't believe it at first. And then John C. Bennett and Chauncey Higby and the other men who are involved in this say, well, we're going to bring a church leader who will tell you that Joseph Smith approves this. And they bring Joseph Smith's brother, Apostle William Smith. Now, when these accounts are published in the newspaper later, they leave William Smith's name out so that the general membership doesn't know that an apostle was actually brought in to give Joseph's stamp of approval on this. And then later in the trial that ended up excommunicating all the men that happened on this, we learned that William Smith was originally going to be tried and Joseph Smith was sitting in the audience, stands up and basically says, if I hear my family's name being dragged through the mud, either I'm going to die or you are, and Brigham Young immediately drops all the charges from William Smith. So all the other men 
get excommunicated, but William Smith does not. So there's an element of nepotism of, of the closed family circle of Joseph Smith being protected from the repercussions of this. And honestly, it shouldn't really just be the John C. Bennett affair of spiritual wifery. It should be the Apostle William Smith thing because he was the one that came in and gave the stamp of approval to these women so that they accepted the doctrine. And what we're going to learn is that doctrine is that the leader of the church can give special permission by revelation and commandment, and that what we thought was sin before is not actually sin in that scenario, and that is exactly what happens in the Nancy Rigdon affair. And that's really what ties all this in to show. And the whole concept of eternal ceilings and families and the, the celestial marriage thing isn't really articulated in this. And you're going to see that it's not in the happiness letter. But okay, so with that discussion in, because we want to get to the events, I'm sure your listeners are like, well, get to the affair. So Chris does a great job of kind of laying this out, starting from the funeral on the 9th. And I'm going to let him kind of go and take it away with that. Okay, so according to John C. Bennett, Mrs. Hyde approached Nancy about this at a funeral. And that's important, uh, not only because of just the incongruity of making a romantic overture at a funeral, but also because Nancy's father, Sidney Riggin, preached the funeral sermon that day, and he focuses his sermon on happiness. And so when Joseph later writes the letter on happiness to convince Nancy to marry him, he echoes the language of Rigdon's funeral sermon, which is kind of interesting. I think he was making a kind of power move here, echoing her father's language in order to convince her. Anyway, Nancy went to the printing office as instructed. Uh, she has been told that Joseph wants to meet her at the printing office, so she goes to the printing office. Um, but Willard Richards answers the door and tells her that Joseph has been detained and so she should come back next Thursday. So she goes away. Just to clarify, it's Marinda who approaches Nancy at the funeral, right? Nancy Marinda Hyde, yes. Yeah, you're right. There's so many Nancys here. I just, <laughs> I, right. I'm like, I'm going to call we'll her call Marinda. Her <laughs> yeah. Or, or Mrs. Hyde. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay, so she's essentially saying, come to my home and Joseph's going to meet you there because the printing office is her home where she's right. living and, with real urchins. And this is an illustration of how Marinda is serving as the recruiter and as a sort of an accomplice in convincing women to marry Joseph. These proposals are happening in her home. That's how closely tied she is to these plural marriage proposals. Right. And this is the pattern that we saw in the Martha Brotherton thing where we're having Joseph or other leaders meet with young women at places that are not their homes so, like, Joseph is not saying, come and meet me in my home where Emma's there and all these other people are there. He's meeting in secret, separate from his home for that. That's just a key part I want to make sure that we remember with this setup. And just a note, Orson Hyde is still out on his mission. That's right. Orson Hyde is away on his mission at this time, yes. Okay, so uh, Nancy Rigdon mentions this situation to her boyfriend, Francis Higby, and Higby asked John C. Bennett about it. Bennett is a close insider at this time, so he has all the sort of dirt on what Joseph Smith is thinking. So that's who Higby goes to. And Bennett warned Higby that Joseph Smith was intending some kind of sexual or plural marriage proposal, and he recommended that Nancy go to this meeting and find out for herself what Joseph wants, but he says, don't place too much reliance on revelation. And uh, Bennett also went to Joseph Smith after he had heard about this, and he told him, Joseph, you're a master mason, and Sidney Rigdon, Nancy's father, is a master mason. So you really should stay away from a fellow master mason's daughter. You have an obligation to your fellow master mason not to mess with his daughter or you'll get in trouble. And Joseph replies, you are my enemy and you wish to oppose me. And Bennett says, no, I'm not your enemy. I just think this is a bad idea. So you see here some of the tensions beginning to emerge between Joseph and John C. Bennett. Nancy takes Bennett's advice, and she goes to the printing office the next Thursday, and she meets with Joseph Smith, according to plan. And according to Bennett, Joseph locked the door, he swore Nancy to secrecy, and then he told her that he loved her, that she had been the idol of his affections for several years, and then he lays out his doctrine of concubinage and plural marriage. He says he has had the blessings of Jacob given to him, and Jacob, uh, the patriarch in the Bible, you may remember that he had two wives, Rachel and Leah, but you probably have forgotten that he also had two concubines, Bilhah and Zilpah. And Joseph Smith seems to have been proposing to make Nancy a concubine, but he says, if you have any scruples about that, then I can privately marry you. So concubine first, but if you have scruples, then we can make it a marriage. The difference between a concubine and a wife is, 
as they would have understood it at that time. Did he outright use the word concubine or are we just putting that name on what it is by definition? That is mostly a name that we're putting on something that he generally didn't use that term. Okay, so it's basically somebody that you can have sexual access to who's not technically your wife. And exactly. because there's a biblical precedent in both Jacob as well as Solomon, and so we have the idea that God has approved this at some point, then he could have used biblical precedent to get them to accept that as long as they invoke these patriarchs from the Bible. That's exactly right. And in the letter on happiness, he does invoke Solomon as well, who also had quite a few concubines. So he, he's laying the biblical precedent for both for plural marriage and for concubine simultaneously. And he also says that if he marries her, that wouldn't prevent her from marrying anyone else, which is kind of interesting. So he seems to be laying out an idea of polyandry here, too, that she can be married to multiple people. And then he tries to kiss her. And Nancy is insulted and angry at this point, and she pushes him away. And she says, if she ever gets married, it will be to a single man or to no one at all. And she threatened to scream and alert the neighbors unless Joseph immediately opened the door and let her out, which he did. And after letting her out of the room, he asked Mrs. Hyde to explain matters to her, and he also promised to write her a letter, and then he left the house. And so Mrs. Hyde takes Nancy aside and says, look, I know it seems strange. It seems strange to me at first, too, when I first heard about this. But you'll feel better about it once you think about it and pray about it a little. And Nancy's reply was, I never shall. And she left the house. Nancy Rigdon was kind of a badass. <laughs> And then uh, a slightly different version of this story. I just want to make sure that we nod to this um, because it does read a little bit differently. Nancy's brother, John Rigdon, many years later in the year 1900, tells this story. And he says that Nancy was at a church meeting, that Mrs. Hyde sat down with Nancy at this church meeting and explained the doctrine of polygamy to her and the exaltation that could be obtained by it. And then a couple hours later, Joseph Smith came along and proposed marriage to her. So John Rigdon's version doesn't mention concubinage or extramarital sex. He's framing it, the entire thing, as a plural marriage proposal. And he also doesn't mention the printing office or really any of the little details described by Bennett. But I think it's important to note that this version of the story is written down almost 60 years later, that John was not a party to these events, really, and that he's looking at this incident through the lens of later plural marriage doctrine. So I think that the main value of his account is just to corroborate that a proposal did take place. I don't think he's that useful for the details of the proposal. All right, so we've got the proposal happening. I, I got to think that Joseph is uh, a little bit worried just because here he may have set fire to a powder keg that he didn't realize was going to blow up the way that it did. He doesn't waste any time getting that letter to her. How does the letter get delivered to Nancy? Well, you know what? Let me first talk a little bit about this concubine thing because I just want to I want to establish a little bit more context on that. So this disciplinary hearing that happened in May was all about men approaching women and saying that they're allowed to have sex outside of marriage. And three different women testify in these minutes. And these minutes are produced by the church. So this is a church document. Three women testify that four different men told them that they had heard this teaching directly from Joseph Smith. So there's quite a bit of evidence within that document that Joseph Smith was the source of this doctrine. And John C. Bennett told Catherine Fuller that Joseph Smith himself was conducting in that manner, meaning that he was having extramarital sexual relations. And there's a couple different doctrinal justifications that they give for this. One is that the prohibition against adultery doesn't mean single women, it means married women. That's what Chauncey Higby told Sarah Miller. So... Single women are allowed to have sex with as many people as they want. The Bible only prohibits adultery. It doesn't prohibit fornication. So that's one justification. And in fact, William Smith goes so far as to approach Catherine Fuller on her wedding day and say, don't get married because if you get married, I won't be able to have sex with you anymore, <laughs> which is pretty audacious. So then the other justification that Chauncey Higby gave was that there is no sin where there is no accuser. And we actually have a record of a sermon that Joseph Smith gave in which he says much the same thing. This was a public sermon that Joseph Smith gave. He says, if we did not accuse one another, God would not accuse us. And if we had no accuser, we should enter heaven. If we would not accuse him, meaning Joseph, he would not accuse us. 
And if we would throw a cloak of charity over his sins, he would throw one over ours. For charity covered a multitude of sins, and what many people called sin was not sin. And he did many things to break down superstition, and he would break it down. Joseph Smith gave the sermon on November 7th, 1841. And it's using that same language. If we don't accuse each other, God will not accuse us. So there's no sin where there's no accuser. There's no damnation where there's no accuser. In effect, this is saying there's no condemnation if you don't get caught. The other thing that's pretty significant about this trial record is that Lyman O. Littlefield testifies at the trial that he's come to the conclusion now that Joseph Smith actually disapprobates this practice, meaning Joseph Smith is actually opposed to this practice, but that Joseph Smith sometimes practices a sort of spiritual entrapment where he tries to persuade men to act wickedly and then exposes them. So this is something that Joseph Smith also tries to tell Nancy's family, which we'll get to in a moment, that this was uh, just a test of her virtue, this proposal. So this is a rationale that he uses often. So I think that the fact that Lyman O. Littlefield originally believed that Joseph Smith was teaching this doctrine and then comes to believe that Joseph Smith was just practicing this spiritual entrapment and testing him, I think that adds a lot of credibility to the testimony that this doctrine is coming from Joseph Smith. Because we're seeing that same pattern emerge where Joseph Smith is telling people this doctrine, and then when he gets caught, he's telling them that it was a test. The reoccurrence of that pattern, I think, adds a lot of credibility to this. Oh, yeah. That's a real good point. Okay, so essentially, Joseph has left Nancy, who was uh, kind of tried to calm down and convinced a little bit with Miranda. They all go back to their homes. Nancy goes back to her home. She doesn't live too far from Joseph in Nauvoo. It's just the next block over. And so then what happens next? So Joseph writes this letter to Nancy, the, the letter on happiness, which is laying out the whole theology that we're going to be talking about. It's an interesting mix of permissive language and divine commandment language. Joseph Smith doesn't seem to have a clear sense of whether he's allowed to do this stuff or whether he's commanded to do this stuff. And we see that same vacillation between permissive language and commandment language in DNC 132. But anyway, he writes this letter and then the letter is delivered to Nancy. Nancy by Willard Richards, and Willard Richards tells her to burn the letter after she's done reading it. And by the way, important point, Willard Richards served as a scribe for the letter, so the letter was not in Joseph Smith's handwriting, which will become significant later when Joseph Smith is uh, kind of denying authorship of the letter, and Sidney Rigdon is reinforcing those denials by pointing out that the letter is not in Joseph Smith's handwriting. That's kind of a strategy that Joseph Smith uses to provide himself some plausible deniability as he uses scribes so that none of this stuff is actually in his handwriting. And that's not unusual. Willard Richards is acting as Joseph's scribe for other church business at this time. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Joseph Smith is pretty much always using scribes. Okay. So Joseph Smith, in this letter, maybe you want to talk about the language of the letter, Jonathan. Why don't you summarize the language of the letter? Well, the letter itself lays out using some of Joseph Smith's most beautiful, most scriptural, most powerful rhetoric, using the language of piety, alluding to some of God's glorious promises, as well as some of his sternest boundaries. And I think that's why it's quoted so frequently is it is a really powerful letter. The problem is when you dig down into what is actually being said, and when you look at the type of religious rhetoric that other non-Mormon, not tied to Joseph at all, other religionists have used in order to break down moral boundaries and engage in unorthodox sexual practices to include child abuse, to include free love, all sorts of things. You know, every one of those religious charlatans had to come up with a religiously oriented doctrinal theological justification in order to subvert the morality of the people that were their targets. And I think what we have in this letter is the pure most clear and unobscured form of the type of teaching Joseph Smith was doing to do exactly that. Now, you mentioned a talk that he gave in 1841. There are other examples, including the Doctrine and Covenant section 132, where 
he's conveying these principles in much vaguer terms, in multi-layered allusions that aren't specific and that are complicated and obscured, frankly, by a bunch of other issues, giving a little bit of plausible deniability. The happiness letter doesn't have that. It's, it's just pure crystalline um, religious manipulation, frankly. And so my part of the presentation at Sunstone, which I'm hoping Bill can play here, just takes the letter and breaks it down stanza by stanza and just shows you how this messaging is used to try to break down the conventional moral ideas of this young 19-year-old who before this has been totally beholden to the prophet. He's hitting her with this stuff out of the blue and reformulate her moral conscience in a way that would be permissive and even celebratory of anything that Joseph would propose to her. And it plays on her naivety, her credulity, her trust in the prophet. It plays on her trust in her father and some of the language that Joseph used that's borrowed from her father. It plays on her own desire to feel special. You know, you could say that we're injecting all of these motives into the letter, but when you look at how other religious charlatans use these psychological levers to prey upon their targets, you start to see patterns. And those same patterns are used here. All right, stop. We're going to play here a reading of the happiness letter. Uh, we'll play that. And then following that, we're also going to have a section from Sunstone where Jonathan Streeter disassembles the letter and talks about the manipulative concepts in it. But first, the straight reading of it. Happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. And this path is virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping all the commandments of God. But we cannot keep all the commandments without first knowing them, and we cannot expect to know all or more than we now know unless we comply with or keep those we have already received. That which is wrong under one circumstance may be and often is right under another. God said, Thou shalt not kill. At another time he said, Thou shalt utterly destroy. This is the principle on which the government of heaven is conducted, by revelation adapted to the circumstances in which the children of the kingdom are placed. Whatever God requires is right, no matter what it is although we may not see the reason thereof till long after the events transpire. If we seek first the kingdom of God, all good things will be added. So with Solomon, first he asked wisdom, and God gave it him, and with it every desire of his heart, even things which might be considered abominable to all who understand the order of heaven only in part, but which in reality were right because God gave and sanctioned by special revelation. A parent may whip a child, and justly too, because he stole an apple. Whereas, if the child had asked for the apple, and the parent had given it, the child would have eaten it with a better appetite, and there would have been no stripes. All the pleasures of the apple would have been secured, and the misery of stealing lost. This principle will justly apply to all of God's dealings with his children. Everything that God gives us is lawful and right, and it is proper that we should enjoy his gifts and blessings whenever and wherever he is disposed to bestow. But if we should seize upon those same blessings and enjoyments without law, without revelation, without commandment, those blessings and enjoyments would prove cursings and vexations in the end, and we should have to lie down in sorrow and wailings and everlasting regret. But in obedience there is joy and peace unspotted, unalloyed. And as God has designed our happiness, the happiness of all his creatures, he never has, he never will institute an ordinance or give a commandment to his people that is not calculated in its nature to promote that happiness which he has designed and which will not end in the greatest amount of good and glory to those who become the recipients of his law and ordinances. Blessings offered but rejected are no longer blessings, but become like the talent hid in the earth by the wicked and slothful servant. The proffered good returns to the giver, 
The blessing is bestowed on those who will receive and occupy. For unto him that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundantly. But unto him that hath not or will not receive shall be taken away that which he hath or might have had. Be wise today, tis madness to defer. Next day the fatal precedent may plead. Thus on till wisdom is pushed out of time into eternity. Our Heavenly Father is more liberal in His views and boundless in His mercies and blessings than we are ready to believe or receive, and at the same time is more terrible to the workers of iniquity, more awful in the executions of His punishments, and more ready to detect every false way than we are apt to suppose Him to be. He will be inquired of by His children. He says, Ask, and ye shall receive. Seek, and ye shall find. But if ye will take that which is not your own, or which I have not given you, you shall be rewarded according to your deeds. But no good thing will I withhold from them who walk uprightly before me and do my will in all things, who will listen to my voice and to the voice of my servant whom I have sent. For I delight in those who seek diligently to know my precepts and abide by the laws of my kingdom. For all things shall be made known unto them in mine own due time, and in the end they shall have joy. That was a reading of the happiness letter. Now we're going to listen to Jonathan Streeter as he disassembles this letter, going through the various mechanisms of manipulation that are used. All right. If any of you are familiar with the blog, Thoughts on Things and Stuff, or the YouTube channel, Thinker of Thoughts, then you'll know that I start with history and then try to dive a little bit deeper and look into the context of some other religious movements and see what we can learn from there and then apply to our analysis of Joseph Smith. We're going to take a dive into looking at the language of the happiness letter and reflect on whether or not it matches the pattern that we may find in other religious sexual predators. Now, if we want to know what a religious sexual predator looks like, then we kind of have to look at the history of other religious sexual predators so that we can kind of figure out how a duck quacks so that if we hear a duck quack, we can know that it's a duck. So we've got an example here of six different religious professors, and you may actually recognize some of the stories. Uh, this is Wayne Bent here in the upper left-hand corner. He claimed that God was going to destroy him if he did not have sex with his daughter-in-law. We've got David Koresh down in the lower left-hand corner who claimed that there was a, a significant scripturally based religious justification for him to dissolve the marriage bonds of everybody in his flock so he could have sexual access to the women in his flock for a very biblical reason. We've got other representatives who were able to come up with religious and biblical and theological justifications for their unorthodox sexual activities, and they were different from each other. So a member of one group might look out at one of the other groups and say, that, that prophet has it all wrong. My prophet is the real prophet. But at the end of the day, you really have to engage in a form of special pleading in order to do that. But we're going to try to avoid that pitfall of special pleading when we do this analysis. So when you look at all of these different stories and you try to paint the picture of a religious sexual predator, you're going to find some things pop up again and again. You're going to find that the individual claims divine sanction for their unorthodox sexual practices. You're going to see them appeal to the devotion and piety of the targets of their predations. You're going to find that they have created religious justification. In some cases, it may be as simple as, well, God said that love is love, and we're going to interpret that as sexual love, and it's free. That would be the case of the leader of the children of God. Or it may be a more complex, multi-layered theological justification, and we're left to decide whether or not the degree of ornate justification sublimates something that we would otherwise consider abominable, or whether it really doesn't make a difference. So when you look down at the root mechanisms of these types of manipulations, and if you want to learn about it, you can do searches for documentaries about these different group leaders and listen to the stories of the survivors so you can see how they were able to take people who started out with conventional moral a moral compass of what was right and the boundaries of propriety and their morality was subverted by the messaging and the self-proclaimed prophet 
used enticement, they used fear, they used guilt, threat, obligation. All of these things were part of the toolkit of the religious manipulator. And it was all bound up by secrecy. All right, so the happiness letter. Now, when you guys, how many people here know what the happiness letter is or have heard of it before today? If you take some time and you're in your ward or anything, you might ask people, you know, do you know what the happiness letter is? And chances are you'll have my experience where people are like, what is that? I don't know what that is. But they will probably have heard it if you start with the first stanza because it's a very familiar stanza. Happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. So we're going to take a moment and we're going to go through the happiness letter stanza by stanza and we're going to examine the language of manipulation that is woven throughout the letter. All right, so let's talk about the language and mechanics of manipulation. Now, in any manipulative endeavor, the perpetrator begins with some knowledge of his target, his mark. He wants to understand the motivations, desires, insecurities, and proclivities of his target. And this allows him to tailor his approach so that it will hit just the right notes to persuade, but also to give the target the sense that their submission is voluntary and the product of their own free will and priorities. In many cases, which we see at the start of this letter, the, the manipulation starts with an appeal to something that the target desires. This is the honey in the trap, the bait on the hook. And the target's desire for this bait becomes the fuel for the rest of the manipulation. Now, such enticements could be strictly secular. The fo- this type of focus is common in financial forms of fraud. For example, Bernie Madoff appealed to his client's desires for financial success, and that was enhanced by the sense of an elite status that you qualified for his unique investment scheme. The people behind pyramid schemes, Ponzi schemes, cash gifting circles, and other forms of financial fraud will often use these secular types of enhancements. There There are religious manipulations as well, and these draw upon more existential desires, divine acceptance, healing, salvation, spiritual rebirth, absolution, enlightenment. All of these touchstones have been used by various religious charlatans throughout history. Now, these metaphysical objects of desire are enhanced when they're tied together with other coveted ideas, prosperity, well-being in this life and the next. And these may be connected with the spiritual obligations that are communicated by the predator. The elite feeling of being among a chosen people with special callings, trials, blessings is a really strong appeal, particularly to vulnerable people who may have little else in their life to feel elite about. Now, if you examine all of those six men that we have there, you'll find elements of this in the story of every one of their survivors. Now, in the opening line, Joseph invokes a very universal enticement, happiness. Now, notice that Joseph is not adorning his enticement with the complex theological framework that emphasizes the need to seal or bind families together. Now, that's a common apologetic rationale that is used to justify Joseph's unconventional polygamous proposals, but it's nowhere in this letter. He begins instead with something simple and pure, the state of happiness in this life and the next. Now, this is something which even a child could respond positively to, and it doesn't require any deep doctrinal elaboration. Now, alluding to this promised state of bliss is not the whole of Joseph's manipulation. The manipulation takes a clearer shape when the if-then statements begin to appear. Now, Joseph quickly establishes the requirements for this promised blessing using the metaphor of a path which must be followed. Happiness will be the ultimate state of our eternal existence if we follow the path to it. And this concept serves as the foundation for the rest of the letter. Joseph spends the next several paragraphs defining the path and establishing the consequences for those who either accept or reject his prescriptions. Now notice that Joseph, throughout this letter, uses inclusive language. He says, we, our, he he includes himself. And he does this to make it seem as though he and his target are under the same requirements when in fact they are in very different positions. Joseph is the one setting up the hoops to jump through, while Nancy is the one who must do the jumping to get the prize. Now, it should be noted here as well that the theme of happiness is one which would be familiar to Nancy, and that's because both Joseph and Sidney spoke at that funeral, and Sidney's sermon was on the theme of happiness. Joseph may have used this language in order to give a sense of familiarity and propriety to his petition, sort of twisting the trust that she had for her father against her. All right, so let's go to the next stanza. 
And this path is virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping all the commandments of God. Now, I want you to take a look at this list. It's made up entirely of seemingly positive ideals. An individual who considers themselves religious or spiritual, even without knowing the source, could look at this list as a series of guiding moral ideals and principles, each ideal appealing to their own aspirations of goodness. But this is all part of the deception. On the surface, there is nothing which really raises a red flag, but it's important to remember that these ideas of virtue, holiness, and divine command are subject to the definition of whoever claims the authority to define them. Now, throughout history, a wide array of religious con artists have distorted and redefined these notions to alarming degrees. Here are some examples. For a member of the children of God, virtue may be found in following the teachings of its leader, David Berg, which includes using sexual enticement to gain converts and involving children in abusive sexual activities. For a member of the Church of Christ scientist, uprightness may be achieved by adhering to the admonition of the church's founder, Mary Baker Eddy, and rejecting medical science in favor of faith healing and the idea that all sickness is the result of spiritual weakness. For a member of the Jehovah's Witnesses, faithfulness may be proven by denying a sick one a life-saving blood transfusion resulting in a preventable death, or by completely cutting a loved one out of your life if they choose to leave the faith. And this is all encouraged by the men in the governing body of the institution. For a member of the Unification Church, holiness may be attained by surrendering one's will to sinful humanity and consenting to be married to a stranger in a mass ceremony in order to be grafted into God's sinless lineage under the blessing of church founder Sun Young Moon. Now, while some of these examples are more benign than others, the alarming principle at work here is the notion that individuals claiming special divine sanction are able to use supposed divine authority and the name of God to compel people to do things that they would otherwise completely reject. All of these examples involve people following a path towards happiness as defined by their respective charismatic leader, Joseph also follows this pattern and makes sure to include the catch-all concept by summarizing the path to virtue being found in the statement that you must follow all the commandments of God with a strong emphasis on the all. All right, let's go to the next section. We cannot keep all the commandments without first knowing them, and we cannot expect to know all or more than we know unless we comply with or keep those we have already received. Now, here Joseph is using a sense of urgency and lists more requirements. This sets up another assault on the conscience of his target. Joseph has already planted the idea that his target cannot achieve true happiness unless they follow all of God's commandments. And now he's establishing that an individual can't even learn what all of the commandments are unless they're obeying those which they've already been given. The fact that Joseph chooses to convey this message only after claiming that he has been given commandment to take Nancy as a secret, illegal, plural wife should not be overlooked. The unspoken imperative here is that neither Joseph nor his target will be able to achieve happiness unless they comply. Another danger here is that this compels people in Joseph's orbit to obey anything that he puts forth under the name of God, both now and in the future. Now, you can review the bad outcomes of groups under the influence of religious manipulation. Jonestown, the Branch Davidians, Heaven's Gate. Each of these reveal that the horrific outcomes was facilitated by a charismatic leader who wove a web of undue influence over the minds of their followers. This is characterized by the notion that the leader's instructions could only be righteously answered by obedience. Now, the leaders did not start out by giving the extreme commands which led to the deadly headlines. Rather, they started by instilling the notion that obedience to the leader was equivalent to obedience to God and should be done without question or doubt. Now, it's not the extreme outcome of these examples which is the problem. It is the culture of irreproachable authority which lies behind them. Even if a group doesn't end up involved in mass suicide, if the teachings and expectations of the leader or leaders imposes this high demand for obedience upon the members, that is the moral and ethical root of the problem.
This demand for obedience is the underlying message woven throughout Joseph's happiness letter. Obedience at the threat of one's eternal soul. It echoes through the issues of polygamy into the Mountain Meadows massacre, racism, sexual abuse, and even bigotry of today. Joseph has set up the stakes, and next he delivers the linchpin of his entire religious ethic, a concept which places his commands above the conscience and judgment of his target. Next, this is a key section. That which is wrong under one circumstance may be and often is right under another. God said, thou shalt not kill. At another time, he said, thou shalt utterly destroy. This is the principle on which the government of heaven is conducted by revelation adapted to the circumstances in which the children of the kingdom are placed. Now, remember that Joseph is drafting this letter to a 19-year-old young woman who has refused his proposal for secret illegal bigamy, a practice that she saw as adultery. He's creating a religious justification for how and why this woman could receive his proposition as an act of righteousness and see him as a man of God, even though his request violates her sense of virtue, morality, and godliness. At the core of his message, Joseph endeavors to use religious rhetoric to make that which is wrong appear right. He introduces this concept and in so doing points out that these circumstantial exceptions are not extremely rare, but are in fact frequent enough to be described as occurring often. In order to make this point, Joseph uses the effective approach of taking something even more offensive than sexual sin and showing how it could be seen as righteousness. Thou shalt not kill. The scriptural injunction against murder found in Exodus in the Ten Commandments, if Joseph could turn this instruction on its head and show how God could justify killing in certain circumstances, then a call for polygamy would be almost trivial by comparison. And accordingly, Joseph does just this. Thou shalt utterly destroy... Four words that are only found together once in scripture in Deuteronomy 20 as part of instructions for the complete and utter killing of the inhabitants of six different cities to include men, women, and children. Now, this particular scripture is the subject of a great deal of debate in modern times because it's often interpreted as an example of God commanding genocide. Those who defend the Bible spend a great deal of effort trying to demonstrate how this is not exactly the case. They appeal to many different moral rationales to do so. Joseph does not do this, however. He cites this scripture as an example of God by command through a prophet overturning the prohibition on murder due to circumstance. Joseph accepts this passage as a command for genocide and uses that contradiction to rationalize his violation of monogamy and sexual fidelity on the basis of divine revelation and command. Joseph states that these moral contradictions occur as a principle upon which the kingdom of God is based, citing revelation and circumstances to imply that they are simple, commonplace administrative procedures and should even be expected. Keep in mind that at no point in the entire happiness letter does Joseph ever directly mention marriage or sexual morality. He cites murder and theft, but steers away from directly addressing his subject. Joseph's reminder that this principle applies to children of the kingdom serves two manipulative purposes. First, it allows his target to feel the pride of being part of an exclusive chosen followers of the restored kingdom of God, something made possible by Joseph himself. Second, it reinforces the idea that people receiving these contradictory instructions are like children, immature, naive, and thus unable to understand or question the wisdom behind the apparent contradictions that they are compelled to accept. Still, Joseph understands that he's not addressing a subdued sycophant. Nancy has already demonstrated her moral grounding and resilience in the face of his prophetic claims. Therefore, Joseph knows he has to apply every bit of his powers of persuasion to overcome her conscientious objection, which means finding a way for her to doubt her own judgment. And the next section of the letter adopts this tactic directly. Whatever God commands is right, no matter what it is. Although we may not see the reason thereof till long after events transpire. If we seek first the kingdom of God, all good things will be added. So with Solomon. First he asked wisdom and God gave it him and with it every desire of his heart. Even things which might be considered abominable to all who understand the order of heaven only in part but which in reality were right because God gave and sanctioned by special revelation. Now, Joseph starts this section by reinforcing the most important concept of this letter, that no matter what God through Joseph may command, it should be considered right and just. This is a form of divine command morality 
which is the weapon of choice for religious charlatans and manipulators. Joseph then plants the seed of doubt about one's own personal judgment by warning that they may not see the reason that such offensive commands are actually right till long after events transpire. Joseph is instructing his target to quell their own doubts and stifle their conscience. Those concerns are just the product of childish and limited minds, Joseph suggests, and should be ignored in favor of anything that Joseph says God commands. After giving a reason for Nancy to doubt her own wisdom in objecting to such prophetic instructions, Joseph offers her a new kind of wisdom, a wisdom embodied by the scriptural paragon of wisdom Solomon himself. This leads to an important subtext in this part of the letter. In describing the blessings of Solomon, Joseph is indirectly referring to the taking of multiple wives and concubines, as Solomon is famous for 700 wives and 300 concubines. Doctrine and Covenants section 132 invokes the name of Solomon for the same reason. Joseph reminds Nancy that Solomon's faithfulness resulted in both wisdom as well as treasure and the desires of his heart, things which were otherwise considered gratuitous. The implication here is that taking numerous wives is something that was the part of every desire of Solomon's heart. Joseph is demonstrating that desire can be seen as driving a prophet's action in secretly pursuing women other than his first wife and may be counted as righteousness, even though it would otherwise be considered lust. To make this point even more clear, Joseph acknowledges that such thing might be considered abominable to those ignorant of God's purposes, immediately placing potential objectors into the category of the ignorant, ignorant of the ways and purposes of God. Joseph explains, however, that it's easy to avoid this fate if one understands that God gave special permission to Solomon to accept these abominations by revelation. Thus, Joseph's abominations may be accepted for the same reason, and the abominations are sublimated into righteousness." Joseph is very careful to make sure that he alone is able to sanction and receive such revelations and proclaim God's command and blessings. This letter is a glimpse into how that singular power is wielded in the private lives of those in Joseph's world. Not content to stop at the examples he's already provided, Joseph uses another analogy to make the point that his illicit proposal was divinely approved. A parent may whip a child, and justly too, because he stole an apple, whereas if the child had asked for the apple, the child would have eaten it with a better appetite, and there would have been no stripes. All the pleasures of the apple would have been secured, and the misery of stealing lost. This principle will justly apply to all God's dealing with his children. Since Joseph has now dealt with the issue of divine punishment for the proposal of his secret adulterous bigamy, he turns his attention to the fears of punishment, which he understands are undoubtedly clouding the mind of his young prey. He needs to assure her that the fears of damnation and hellfire, which usually accompany sexual sin, are not in store if she accepts. Rather, pleasures await his target for consenting to his proposition. Under normal circumstances, such an act would carry a painful penalty, but this situation is one which has been granted special allowance by God, according to Joseph, who claims to speak for God because he said so. To convey this reassurance, Joseph employs the metaphor of a child stealing an apple, just as a child who asks permission to eat an apple will enjoy its pleasures more fully, so too will the young woman who accepts Joseph's secret arrangement to be able to freely enjoy the results. Joseph closes by filing this little bit of sophistry under the category of God's dealing with his children. He slathers the language of piety over this brazen manipulation in order to exploit the godly mindset of his target. This is how religious manipulators take advantage of religiously minded people. Next, Joseph draws a clear distinction between those secret illegal marriages which were sanctioned by God and those which were not. Now, examining the historical context of Nauvoo in the spring of 1842 will demonstrate why this distinction is critical, as we heard. All right, next section. Everything that God gives us is lawful and right, and it is proper that we should enjoy his gifts and blessings whenever and wherever he is disposed to bestow. But if we should seize upon those blessings and enjoyments without law, without revelation, without commandment, those blessings and enjoyments would prove cursings and vexations in the end, and we should have to lie down in sorrow and wailings of everlasting regret.
Now, while in the prior section, Joseph assured his young target that she need fear no punishment for consenting to his illicit advances, here he provides a counterpoint that anyone who would try to indulge themselves in such extracurricular activities, but without the express commandment and revelation from God, is committing sin and is therefore subject to everlasting punishment. This section serves two purposes for Joseph. First, it indirectly gives his target a sense of being special in the eyes of God. It is she who was chosen for this special blessing and privilege, while others who have not received this blessing would be harshly punished for violating God's commands. This sense of being special in the eyes of God can be very alluring, particularly to insecure young people who yearn for acknowledgement. No doubt this tactic had worked for Joseph in the past. By the time of his approach of Nancy Rigdon, Joseph had already secretly entered extra-legal relations with 10 women other than his wife, within the range of age 16 to 47. Second, Joseph's direct condemnation of those who would indulge their desires without the blessings of God serves to quell concerns Nancy might have based on current events and rumors going around Nauvoo at this time. At the time of the letter's creation, there were rumors circulating in Nauvoo that high-level leaders in the church were engaged in secret sexual relations with women with the use of religious justification. Joseph and other leaders have publicly condemned those ideas and denied any similar practice. This section serves to rectify that apparent disparity in the mind of his target. Now, just six months prior to this statement, Joseph delivered a sermon declaring, if we do not accuse one another, God would not accuse us. And if we had no accuser, we should enter into heaven. Going on to say, what many people call sin is not sin. This gave doctrinal cover to the notion that if illicit relations were kept secret, then there would be no sin found in them, especially if done with the blessing of Joseph. In the spring of 1842, the very time that Joseph is approaching Nancy, the high council in Nauvoo is receiving testimony from women acknowledging that leaders such as John C. Bennett, then mayor and one of the counselors in the presidency, is using this justification in order to take on spiritual wives and have sexual intercourse with them. The testimonies recorded regarding this incident invoke the idea that Joseph gave sanction to having secret relation by special permission, just as Joseph is teaching in this letter. Other men and leaders of the church are implicated in these accusations, including the prophet's own brother, Apostle William Smith. In the aftermath of these disclosures, Joseph denies ever teaching any such principle and demands that the men involved publicly deny he ever sanctioned their actions. This letter demonstrates that Joseph was, in fact, asserting that special permission can be granted by the prophet for things which are otherwise considered moral abominations. The difference here is that when those accusations against Bennett and others became public, Joseph was able to deny that he had ever given such permission and so could paint the offenders publicly as sinners while privately fulfilling his own desires for relations with multiple women. This distinction between illicit activities which are rendered divine by special permission and those which are damnable for their lack of it carries through today in the narrative of the church. It's one of the primary talking points of apologists addressing the issue of Joseph Smith's polygamy. Keep in mind that special divine permission is nothing new when you look at religious charlatans. Self-proclaimed prophet David Koresh of the Branch Davidians claimed special divine permission to take child brides for the purpose of producing the 24 elders foretold in the book of Revelations. Special proclaimed prophet Wayne Bent of the Lord Our Righteousness Church claimed special divine permission for having sexual relations with children, even his own daughter-in-law, in order to avoid God's punishment. Self-proclaimed prophet Julius Shacknow of the sect known as The Work claimed special privilege to promise salvation in exchange for sexual intercourse with women and children, including his own stepdaughter. Self-proclaimed prophet Tony Alamo of, of Alamo Christian Ministries claimed special biblical permission to illegally marry multiple women and children. Special prophet David Berg of the Children of God claimed special divine permission to normalize sexual relation with children. Prophets justifying their own predations as special divine permission through the use of pious language and religious sentiment is nothing new. They should be seen for the predators that they are. But how is a naive 19-year-old in the 1800s confronted by the very prophet she has revered from the age of eight supposed to know that? Joseph uses this section of the letter to impose his authority to draw the line between illicit relations that receive God's blessings and those which do not. Having underlined this point, Joseph then moves on to reinforce the theme of happiness as linked to his proposition. All right, so moving on to the next section. 
But in obedience, there is joy and peace unspotted, unalloyed. And as God has designed our happiness, the happiness of all his creatures, he never has, he never will institute an ordinance or give a commandment to his people that is not calculated in its nature to promote that happiness which he has designed and which will not end in the greatest amount of good and glory to those who become the recipients of his laws and ordinances. Now, one of the most powerful ways to induce someone to act against their previously held principles is to subvert their higher values. Joseph knows that his target is extremely devout and God-fearing, and he's already inculcated her mind with the idea that he alone can declare the will of God. He's declared his deviant proposal to be a righteous and blessed command of God and attempted to alleviate his target's fear of punishment because his proposition contradicts her own moral sensibilities. He is leveraging her reverence of God against her own moral conscience. He takes the concept a step further by conflating obedience to God with obedience to a man who claims to speak for God. In Joseph's eye, there's no distinction between the two. So as long as it's Joseph's version of God's commands that are obeyed. Joseph continues to wax poetic about the glorious blessings that will accompany obedience to his will, a joy and happiness that are actually God's design from the beginning. In fact, Joseph assures his young target that God would never command anything that would lead to anything other than happiness, and not just any happiness, but the greatest amount of good and glory. This is exactly how religious predators play the trust me, I only want what's best for you card. This idea certainly carries more weight when you transpose it so that it appears to come from God. But the intentions are the same. The goal of the charlatan is to break down any resistance or concern that may exist in the mind of their target so that the trusting target can be induced to surrender to their will. For those who want proof of the fictitious nature of this promise that obedience to polygamy can only lead to happiness, just look at the lives of the women who were subsequently afflicted with it. Even the most vocal modern apologists for the church on polygamy, Brian Hales, concedes that it was a terrible experience in practice, far from the promised bliss of this letter. In the end, the modern church can only rely on law, command, and obedience as justification for the practice of polygamy because conscience, ethics, equality, morality, and stability all scream out against it. The next section, blessings offered but rejected are no longer blessings, but become like the talent hid in the earth by the wicked and slothful servant. The proffered good returns to the giver. The blessing is bestowed on those who will receive and occupy for unto him that hath shall be given and he shall have abundantly, but unto him who hath not or will not receive shall be taken away that which he hath or might have had. Here it becomes apparent that there's a pattern to Joseph's letter. He repeatedly alternates between offering positive assurances and blessings for accepting his proposition or offering threats and punishment for refusing it. This section carries the theme of negative consequences for refusal. Pleasant language and biblical imagery are employed to soften the message that anyone who refuses to be Joseph's secret bride or sexual plaything is wicked and slothful. Not only will they miss out on the glorious blessings, they'll also lose blessings that they already have now. This is perhaps the nicest way to make a bold-faced threat against someone who may rebel. It would not be surprising to hear such a threat be uttered by an organized crime syndicate against a business owner. After all, you know, gee, it would be a shame if something was, uh, you know, to happen to that nice store you got. That routine is very common in the shakedown. Manipulative religionists follow this routine in a different way. As Joseph showcases here, it would be like, gee, it would be a shame if all those blessings that you were enjoying were to be taken away. These are not the words of a man of God instilling virtue. These are the words of a predator who uses tacit threats and manipulation to induce a vulnerable target to fall victim to his carnal designs. Now, by including a poetic stanza here, Joseph takes a cue from John C. Bennett. Be wise today, tis madness to defer. The next day the fatal precedent may plead thus on till wisdom is pushed out of time into eternity. Now, if you read Bennett's expose or any of his writing, he interjects poetry very, very frequently. And we can see here Joseph is kind of adopting this approach. He cites a verse which uses emotionally charged language such as madness, fatal precedent, wisdom, eternity, in an attempt to override the moral conscience of a youth with urgency and fear. This subtle manipulation speaks to Joseph's amoral intuition and facility with language, specifically the power of language to influence others. Joseph was a powerful orator in public and in private. Nancy's resistance to this manipulation is a testament to her character and strength. Having laid down some tacit threats, Joseph now shifts to making glorious promises once again. 
Our Heavenly Father is more liberal in his views and boundless in his mercies and blessings than we are ready to receive. Once again, Joseph attempts to redefine morality in the mind of his prey. If he can introduce a vague uncertainty about the boundaries of propriety, he can then more easily redefine morality on the strength of his claimed status as the mouthpiece of God. If God's views are more liberal than we're equipped to receive, it means that our old-fashioned notions of sin and moral behavior are potentially more strict than God actually intends. This branch of thought neatly complements Joseph's November 1841 sermon where he declared that what many people call sin is not sin. And these ideas carry the combined implication that the prudish objections to Joseph's extra-legal marital adventures are actually based on outdated and overly restrictive morals and keep objectors from actually receiving God's blessings. This is the effect intended upon the mind of young Nancy. Moving on. And at the same time is more terrible to the workers of iniquity, more awful in the executions of his punishments, and more ready to detect every false way than we are apt to suppose him to be. He will be inquired of by his children. He says, ask and ye shall receive, seek and ye shall find. But if ye will take that which is not your own or which I have not given you, you shall be rewarded according to your deeds. Again, Joseph switches to offering threats. And the brilliance of these contrasting themes in his letters is that he's shaping a new moral framework in the mind of his target. If Nancy's conscience was previously defined by principles such as devotion, fidelity, chastity, Joseph is breaking those ideas down and redefining morality by reframing it to match his own goals. The new moral boundaries can be located by observing where the blessings and punishments are staked. According to Joseph, devotion is found in compliance with God's commands through his prophet. Fidelity is defined as staying true to God and his prophet. Chastity is expanded to be a concept that allows any relations given special permission by God's prophet. Underlying all of this is the unavoidable truth that in Joseph's new religious framework, there is only one virtue, obedience. All other virtues are subordinate to obedience, and obedience may trump any other virtue at any other time, allowing even extremes of murder and genocide should God through Joseph command it, making polygamy trivial. But no good thing will I withhold from them who walk uprightly before me and do my will in all things and will listen to my voice in the voice of my servant who I have sent. Now, when David Koresh, Marshall Applewhite, Jim Jones, or any other self-proclaimed mouthpiece of God instructs others to submit to some heinous act which betrays their conscience, the prudent response is to recoil, to reject their claims, and see these men for the pretenders that they are. The idea that God would use such men to order abominable things refutes their claim to speak for God in the first place. The deception of these charlatans is laid bare no matter how flowing, beautiful, or pious their rhetoric They will insist that their words are not their own, but God's, and thus cannot be rejected. To object to those instructions is to object to God's will. Charlatans continue to employ this tactic because it is so effective against devoted people who have a deep, sincere desire to please God and who are not familiar with the methods of such manipulation. Joseph mimics this tactic here in this stanza. He promises blessings for complete obedience while subtly giving equivalence to the voice of God and his own. He uses the voice of God to declare that he is God's mouth piece in a bit of circular logic that can only be seen by those who are not already under his spell. Joseph God here is speaking with words found nowhere else in scripture. He is delivering a revelation that is no less universal or significant than those found in the doctrine and covenants. In society today, a middle-aged man using the name of God against a teenage girl, inducing her to secretly commit and make herself sexually available to him, is correctly identified as a manipulative predator. Such predators have existed for as long as people have held special reverence for God. In the case of the happiness letter, Joseph exposes his true character to match those manipulative predators joining their ranks. Joseph concludes his letter still speaking in the voice of God. For I delight in those who diligently seek to know my precepts and abide by the laws of my kingdom. For all things shall be made known to them in mine own due time, and in the end they shall have joy. Joseph God here establishes that God's favor is found only in complying with his wishes. Blind obedience is the order of the day. Delight, joy, happiness. This letter is peppered with carrots to be dangled in front of the devoted, naive, and credulous. Nancy had lived in the shadow of the prophet since she was a young child. Her own father's position in the world was held at Joseph's good favor, producing underlying pressure to please the prophet. He threatens her with lost blessings, God's disfavor, and eternal detriment to her soul. 
This letter contains every manipulative and coercive tool that a religious predator has at their disposal. Draped in flowery language and plied against a youth with such a desperate position of power in their community that it would make Harvey Weinstein blush. To accept Joseph as a true prophet and accept his assertions in this letter as God's will is to accept both prophet and God as abusive, coercive, and manipulative, with the prophet enjoying divine sanction to satisfy his own carnal lusts at the expense of the innocent and vulnerable. Examining the happiness letter for what it is causes a moral person to see Joseph in a new light. The letter shows a side of Joseph that is usually clouded with religious cunning, a secret side which can be perceived when the letter is viewed in the context of its writing and the subject of its prose and the psychological manipulation in its wording. These same manipulative, subversive, and amoral sentiments are found peppered throughout his sermons and revelations, although they're usually better hidden behind vague allusions, scriptural adornment, and plausible deniability. Every deplorable point in this letter has its equivalent in section 132. Now, imagine the same words here secretly delivered from some other religious leader to a youth in his congregation over whom he has been licking his lip for years. Would you think such a man spoke for God just because he claimed it? If you rejected his godly claim sanctioned in this act, would you accept any other claimed communication or authority from God by this man? Would you accept it from any other modern church leader of the same? Would you believe any of these six people on the right if they, knowing about their sexual predations, also gave you pleasant sermons? Would that be something that you would want to internalize? These are the questions that should echo in the heart of a person of conscience when considering the words of the prophet Joseph directed to young Nancy Rigdon in the happiness letter. Every time a church leader invokes the phrase, happiness is the object and design of our existence, these questions scream all the louder. The happiness letter and the circumstances which brought it into existence do not depict a man of God. They are the marks of a wolf who adorned himself with the affectation of godliness in order to exploit the trusting and devoted nature of the people around him. It's a credit to the strength and will and courage of Nancy Rigdon that she resisted his predations and raised the alarm to warn others of his nature. She was a whistleblower of the early church. While her efforts were overwhelmed by the forces of other men around her, she stands tall in Mormon history, and we are in her debt for exposing Joseph's hidden character. Thank you. That concludes Jonathan Streeter's Sunstone portion where he disassembles the letter. Now we're going to go back to the conversation between Jonathan Streeter Chris Smith, and myself. There's actually a connection with this letter that will be the subject of a future presentation that I do that goes back hundreds of years with some really surprising connections to the Smith family dealing with folk magic, but I'm going to just keep that as a tease and that'll be a a later thing. But this letter to me is very important in understanding the secret character of Joseph Smith at this time, because it's an insight that you get that really we don't have from any other source. And when you view it in contrast and comparison with the testimonies being given about the John C. Bennett affair and what those women in spiritual wifery are doing, it's really hard to draw a distinction other than if Joseph himself gives you the command verbally, as in that letter to the Relief Society, then it's righteous and good. But if anyone else simply says, oh, Joseph told me we could do this, then that's not righteous and good. And that's really the only distinction you can make to try to carve Joseph out of that. And that's exactly what eventually happens. But that's my take on the letter. You do a great job in your presentation. I'm really zeroing in on the coercive language that Joseph Smith used, the commandment language, in order to try to create a a religious obligation for Nancy to uh, do as he wants her to do. Um, I'm really interested in the permissive language, so let me just give a quick summary of that. Joseph says in this letter that God is more liberal in his views than we're ready to believe, which seems to be implying that God is not opposed to sex outside of marriage. He says happiness is the object of existence and that God won't withhold anything from us that gives us joy and that whatever God gives us is lawful and right. And he invokes Solomon with his 700 wives and 300 concubines as an example of someone who practiced these principles. And I think this fits right in with Joseph Smith's teachings about there being no sin where there's no accuser. And also with the passage I mentioned earlier from Romans 7, the Joseph Smith translation of Romans 7, where he essentially says that things that uh, are good under the law are now no longer good and he doesn't do them, and things that were evil under the law are now no longer evil and he does those things. 
So there's a, this kind of like inversion of morality that he's practicing. He's almost doing away with the whole concept of morality. And this is not something that Joseph Smith was alone in. In the Christian tradition, there occasionally has been what Orthodox Christians would consider a heresy called antinomianism. Antinomianism means essentially against the law. And the Apostle Paul makes a lot of strong statements in Romans and in 1 Corinthians about how Christians are sort of no longer under the law. He says that everything is permissible or lawful for a Christian, but that not everything is beneficial. And so Paul essentially is saying anything goes, but you need to practice a little bit of wisdom. You need to uh, be careful of the consciences of your fellow Christians because some of your fellow Christians have delicate consciences and you shouldn't do things to offend their consciences. But the way that antinomians have read those passages in the New Testament is essentially that Christians are no longer under the moral laws that apply to other people, that grace essentially has freed them to sort of do what they want. And Joseph Smith very much seems to embrace that ideology. And I think that that is his secret ideology and that when he's using the language of divine commandment, he's really using that to manipulate other people. I don't think he really buys into the language of divine commandment. I think what he really buys into is the language of divine permission. At, at any point, he can say that what his desire is, is actually a command from God, and that just amps up the pressure on whoever he's imposing it upon. Right. And it's interesting the way that he frames some of the obligation language in the letter on happiness. He says, basically, if you reject a blessing that is offered to you, then the blessings that you already have will be taken away from you. And he uses the parable of the talents from the New Testament, where a servant is given a talent, and rather than investing it, he buries it in order to keep it safe. And his master gets angry with him for burying the talent rather than investing it and increasing it. And Joseph Smith is using that language from the New Testament to try to create an obligation that because he's offering Nancy something that he perceives as a blessing, Nancy is now obligated religiously to accept that blessing. Yeah. Yeah. He's using both promises of, of glorious blessings as well as implicit threats of taking away things if she doesn't comply. And he just, it's a brilliant masterwork of manipulation that uses all of those things. To me, that's why it has such an impact. Right. And as mentioned earlier, this is echoing the language of Sidney Rigdon's funeral sermon from the day when Mrs. Hyde approached Nancy uh, about this proposal. And Rigdon had taught in that sermon, when we see a principle that makes us the most happy, if we will cultivate that principle and practice it ourselves, it will render others happy. And Joseph Smith's letter starts by saying, happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. So essentially both men's message is that happiness makes right. You know something is right if it makes you happy. So it may be that Smith is sort of weaponizing Nancy's father's words against her in order to seduce her. Although Joseph Smith had said things like this before and Sidney had gotten his ideas on happiness from Joseph Smith, so it may or may not be the case that Joseph Smith is deliberately echoing rigged in there. But I tend to think that it's a, a manipulation. Yeah, I think that's a good point. What we're seeing in the happiness letter was not created out of thin air just for Nancy. What we're seeing is the teachings, the rationalizations, the instructions that have been delivered to any of the people that Joseph would bring into the circle and understanding of polygamy is just here on the page. And so if we hear other people like uh, Willard Richards drafted some letters to his wife in Massachusetts earlier in 1842, and it uses some of these themes, and that just reflects that this is what Joseph is teaching his inner circle who come to accept polygamy. So it's not surprising that we're going to see different points that are crystallized in this letter pop up in Joseph Smith's circle. Yeah, there's a there's a scholar associated with the Joseph Smith papers who has been trying to basically say that Joseph Smith didn't write this letter, that maybe John C. Benner forged this letter and published it under Joseph Smith's name. But I mean, everything in this letter is the culmination of things that Joseph Smith has been thinking about and teaching for years. This is not something that uh, 
than it created, and it's certainly not something that is not reflective of Joseph Smith's point of view. Yeah, uh, you're referring to Garrett Dirkmott's suggestion. And, and to me, I don't know, I, I sent a note to him because I want to see his take on it. My impression is that he understands the problematic nature of the content of this letter, and so he wants to dissociate it from Joseph, and I applaud him for that. And frankly, <laughs> to any apologists who are listening, you will save yourself a great deal of heartache if you take his seeds of doubt about the provenance of this letter and run with it and do not fight back and try to tie this to Joseph because if you tie this to Joseph it is going to make it even harder for people once they start to learn about how religious manipulation works when you see those footprints all over this letter it just really it, it's kind of like you know it's hard to go back and see Bill Cosby as the same way that we used to see him before we learned that he manipulated drugged and raped women once you learn how predators work and you start to see that pattern in somebody that you felt one way about, it's hard to go back to that way and feel that way about them again. All right, so this letter didn't succeed in convincing Nancy, and probably in no small part because the thought of having sex with Joseph Smith was not something that would have made her happy. And it's actually kind of mind-blowing that Joseph Smith's, uh, you know, his conceit in this letter in beginning with an appeal to happiness, as if he just assumes that, of course, the thought of having sex with him would make Nancy happy. And I don't think Nancy saw it that way. So this argument about happiness falls rather flat for Nancy. And he probably should have stuck with just the religious obligation language that he used so successfully on so many other people. But uh, anyway, Nancy tells her boyfriend, Francis Higby, and her parents about Smith's proposal, and rumors start to spread around the city. And Joseph complained to Samuel James that he had approached Nancy Rigdon and asked her to become his spiritual wife, and she had to go and blab about it. So Joseph Smith is not happy that Nancy is telling people about this. And in an attempt to stop the rumors, he comes to the family's home, and he baldly denies the allegation to Nancy's parents. And Nancy is not in the room when Joseph Smith is denying the allegation, but she's in the next room, and she overhears this, and she storms into the room, and she says, Joseph Smith, you are telling that which is not true. You did make such a proposition to me, and you know it. And it's at this point that Nancy's sister, Athalia, chimes in and says, Nancy, are you not afraid to call the Lord's anointed a cursed liar? And Nancy says, no, I am not, for he does lie, and he knows it. Joseph Smith had tangled with the wrong woman here. <laughs> And at this point, Joseph Smith admitted that the incident had happened. He could no longer deny. Nancy's accusation was too forceful for him to credibly deny that this had happened. So he changes his story. He says that he did this in order to test Nancy's virtue, that he didn't really mean this proposal. He was just trying to test her. And Sidney Rigdon is not convinced by this explanation. And so they have some more discussion. George Miller, who has accompanied Joseph Smith on this visit, tells the family that they need to keep quiet about the whole thing because Joseph is the Lord's anointed and God will not suffer him to fall. So don't tell anybody. And then Joseph and George Miller leave the house. And for quite a while after this, Joseph and Sidney's relationship is pretty chilly. Joseph at some point reportedly came to the house in tears and asked for forgiveness, and the family shook his hand and forgave him. But the relationship broke down again, in part because Francis Higby gave John C. Bennett the letter that Smith had written to Nancy, and Bennett eventually publishes that letter in his expose to the church. And so Joseph Smith and his inner circle are retaliating now against the Rigdon family by spreading vicious rumors about Nancy, calling her a whore. Sidney Rigdon goes to Joseph privately and exchanges letters with him, begging him to stop spreading slander about his family. Joseph Smith promises to stop, but then he keeps on doing it. And in an attempt to reconcile with Joseph, Rigdon writes a carefully phrased half-denial of Bennett's story. In this uh, statement, he claims to be speaking for Nancy with her full authorization. He acknowledged that the letter that Bennett had published was a real letter that had been in Nancy's possession, but he says Nancy didn't give Bennett the letter, didn't authorize him to use her name or to publish the letter, and he also says the letter isn't in Smith's handwriting, which, remember, is true. The letter has been scribed by Willard Richards, so it's true that the letter is not in Smith's handwriting. Rigdon also mentions that Joseph had denied authorship of the letter, which is also true. He doesn't mention the part where after denying authorship of the letter, Joseph Smith had then admitted authorship the ship of the letter. He excludes that. So everything Rigdon says here is technically true, but he's lying by omission in order to protect Joseph's reputation. Rigdon also uh, published an acknowledgement that his daughter had near denied the faith, um, but that her experience showed the folly of any persons attempting to overthrow or destroy Joseph Smith. 
and he uh, publishes in two church newspapers a denial of the rumor that Joseph Smith is a fallen prophet. So he's pretty aggressively um, denying these allegations and even going so far as to sort of, I think, participate in some of the slander of his daughter in, a, in kind of a backhanded way. There is one event that uh, stands out in my mind, and that is after John C. Bennett starts writing his letters, Joseph Smith has a special conference where he asks basically for everybody to stand up and to swear that Joseph is of unimpeachable character. And everybody does this except for three different people one of which is Sidney Rigdon. Interesting. Yeah, and then there's another one which is Morrison Pratt. You know, these are all people who basically have these issues with polygamy with Joseph Smith. Um, and then, you know, amidst all of these denials from Sidney Rigdon, possibly just because of publishing timelines, Joseph Smith is still publishing slander. But then he ends up taking some of that back after Rigdon's denials. So Nauvoo policeman Stephen Markham publishes this affidavit claiming that Nancy had had sex with John C. Bennett, that he had witnessed Nancy and John C. Bennett in compromising positions, that their words and gestures were very sexy, and that he thought that they had had an affair. And other people published denials of this, uh, saying that they had been present on the same occasion as Markham and that he had made all this up. And Joseph Smith also published a retraction of Markham's affidavit, saying that he was satisfied with Sidney Rigdon's statement about the John C. Bennett affair and that he had not authorized Stephen Markham to publish this affidavit. Which is interesting because it sort of tacitly acknowledges that the Markham affidavit was a punishment of Sidney Rigdon. And Joseph Smith, when he takes it back, he's taking it back because Sidney Rigdon has satisfied him, not necessarily because he's saying Stephen Markham's affidavit wasn't true. I mean, that is an interesting sort of admission that Joseph Smith is making there when he's framing this in terms of like punishment of Sidney Rigdon. But it's interesting that... Uh, the slander of Nancy kind of continues. As late as 1845, Orson Hyde declares Nancy little, if any, better than a public prostitute. This is during the succession crisis when Brigham Young and Sidney Rigdon are contending for control of the church. Orson Hyde is returning to these slanders of Nancy Rigdon in a way to kind of hurt Sidney Rigdon during the succession dispute. And Hyde claims that what had happened in this Nancy Rigdon incident was that Smith had admonished Nancy for seeing too many suitors, saying that basically this was going to hurt her reputation because she was consorting with too many suitors. And Nancy was so insulted by this reproof that she took revenge on Joseph Smith by making up the story of this marriage proposal. And Hyde says that his own wife's role, Miranda Johnson's role in the episode, uh, was to extend a hand to help a poor, miserable girl out of the very slough of prostitution. And in response to allegations that Joseph had tried to get Nancy for a spiritual wife, Hyde retorted that Joseph should have tried to get her for a carnal wife instead, and then he would have been successful. Then she would have gone along with it. So just vicious slanders about Nancy continue to persist. And I think kind of a nice way to wrap up what I have to say about this is uh, there were a couple poems that were published about the Nancy Rigdon affair. The same month that rumors about Nancy spread, Eliza Snow wrote and published this poem titled The Tattler. And she describes the tattler as the worst and most soulless kind of creature. And I'm pretty sure that she had Nancy in mind when she wrote this. She says, It has been said by some that woman's soul should never hate. But yet one character I almost dare to hate. And even in this age of effeminacy, is there who would say, would think that women should not hate the tattler, whose unhallowed business seems to wake up nonsense and stir up strife? Poor brainless skull, wretched propensity, and wretched the possessor of this execrable vice, whose soul, if soul there is at all, must be unto non-entity so near allied as to require a microscopic power to swell it into visibility." So uh, Joseph Smith once said that the secret of masonry is to keep a secret. And Eliza Snow seems to have really internalized that idea that, you know, that just you breaks can't... my heart when I, I heard know, that. It, it does. Because I have such an endearing view of Eliza Snow as this poet. It hurts me that she would use her talent like that against somebody who I'm now realizing is a flipping badass. Right. Yeah, it, it sucks to see women who have internalized oppression and internalized the ideology of patriarchy. And Eliza, I think, here certainly fits that bill. 
But there's another poem that I want to quote, which is kind of cool. Oliver Only, who was a Mormon dissenter and a self-proclaimed prophet in his own right, seems to have seen through all of these slanders about Nancy. And he wrote a poem that I think makes a nice counterpoint to Eliza's. He says, The sound has gone out her to oppress. Yes, Miss Rigdon now has to bear the slang. Because she did not conform to Joseph Smith's word of God, but barely a youth, she for herself spoke and showed that she was not to be duped. Very nice. All right. So we've talked about the preamble to the letter, the events of the proposal, got the aftermath. Let's talk a little bit about some of the criticisms about everything that we've presented here, starting with, uh, we've alluded to it a little bit, um, which is the provenance. Yeah, I just I would like to know. We have a copy of the letter, which I believe is is penned by John C. Bennett, correct? W- okay. Well, well, I guess I when you say penned, I'm 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 assuming you're talking about when we look at the scanned document whose handwriting is in the earliest copy that I can find in church records of the text of this document is in the handwritten history of the church that served as the document that they eventually published it from. Um, Is that correct in your understanding as well, Chris? Yeah, I mean, there's Bennett's publication of the letter in his printed book, and then there's the history of the church copy. Yeah, so you can find, probably if we want to go back to the very earliest where the public has access to the words of the letter, you'd have to go to the original San Gamo journal that John C. Bennett published his letters in, which he eventually compiled into his book, The History of the Saints. And so that's where the public was first made aware of it. And that issue is actually digitized. You can see that. That's where it first entered into the public mind. But the actual letter in the handwriting of Willard Richards we do not have. All we have is John C. Bennett's that then the church adapted to itself. To my understanding, that's that's the early way we have it. Now, I would have liked to find something even earlier regarding this in the history of the church and the records of the church, but I haven't been able to find it. So John C. Bennett originally uses the letter in his expose, History of the Saints. The church then after uses the letter in its history of the church? Yes, it's published there. And then it's even included in the compilations later about the words of the prophet Joseph Smith, where they go and they take everything that we attribute to Joseph Smith and compile it into a large volume. You'll find the happiness letter in there. They don't refer to it as the happiness letter. They just include it almost as though it was a sermon, just the words of Joseph Smith. And in the wording in the history of the church, they use the exact same wording from John C. Bennett's expose. Yeah, I have not seen uh, any differences. I haven't run an exact textual analysis uh, by computer, but I've read them side by side and I could not find any substantive differences. Okay. And then the last point being is that we know Willard Richards is the one who is connected to this going into the history of the church, and Willard Richards would have been serving as one of the scribes in a heavily used scribe and a heavily connected associate of Joseph Smith during this time frame. So if anybody would have known if the letter was legitimate or not that was living, Willard Richards would be at the top of that list. Yeah, and uh, he never denies it. He's, and, and we refer to these people as Willard Richards, uh, William Smith. These are apostles. This is Apostle Richards. So it's kind of like having Dallin H. Oaks, you know, deliver the letter or something like that. These are, these are the leaders of the church. They're not just yeah, scribes. Mean, right. So if John C. Bennett's put in his expose, if, if Willard Richards believes this is not a legitimate letter, he has all the reason in the world to say, like, let's not include this thing. It's included by one of our critics first in his critical work. We can safely assume Willard Richards is certain one way or another that this letter is uh, originally created by the prophet Joseph Smith and likely was directly connected to it in its creation and that it's included in the history of the church. It seems like it's the most reasonable, rational conclusion by far, as I've looked into it, to safely assume this letter is legitimate And it's Joseph Smith's ideology. Well, and it's so important too, Bill, to look at the exact language of Sidney Rigdon's denial of Joseph Smith's authorship of the letter. Because Sidney doesn't say, Joseph didn't author the letter. He doesn't say, I I don't believe Joseph offered the letter, right? He says, the letter's not in Joseph Smith's handwriting, and Joseph denied to me that he had authored the letter. So I think that what he's not saying is as revealing as what he is saying. And you see a lot of that in the history of the church, where if you pay attention to what they don't say, it's often much more informative than what they do. 
Yeah, and Bennett must have had a, a copy of the letter, obviously, if he gets all the wording right. And if we had the original letter, it, it may very well be in Willard Richard's own handwriting. I don't think we're ever going to get a copy of the actual letter because that came out of the possession of the church and never made it back. It's my understanding, unless it's you know in some hidden vault safe somewhere. But it is worthwhile to take the objections raised by Garrett Dirk Mutt and acknowledge them. In that his case is that, listen, as historians, if we evaluate any other document with the same problems of provenance as this letter, just on face value in terms of where is the source of the language coming from, if it was any other document, we would have serious reservations about considering it to be authentic, just on following the the provenance. And I think that's a legitimate concern to raise. It's just when you look at everything else around it, beyond the line of where we get the text from in terms of what are the other things that Joseph Smith was teaching. I think there's some people who've raised objections to Dirk Mott's presentation who say that, you know, there's nothing actually new in this letter. Joseph Smith at various times had taught everything that's in this letter. Not only that, but other people who later testified about the way that Joseph Smith introduced them into polygamy used some of the exact same arguments, including the talents and things like that. So there's peripheral stuff which corroborates this beyond the line of, of where the text came from. And, you know, those are good objections to raise. There was a response given by D. Michael Quinn to the presentation, raising the question about provenance. And one of the things that he cites are early contemporaries of Joseph Smith that use excerpts from this letter in their talks as early as like the 1850s, you know, very early in the church. Usually before his response, I think most people traced the use of the letter in general conference to Golden Kimball in the 1930s or 1940s or something like that. But Quinn was able to point out that even Joseph's contemporaries very early in the church were using themes from the letter. So the critics, they raise a valuable point, but there's so much overwhelming evidence that points to this being from Joseph Smith. Not only that, but the language of the letter is very different from what you would expect John C. Bennett to include in his expose if he was trying to really get Joseph Smith in trouble. If he was really trying to expose Joseph Smith, he would not have hidden the idea of polygamy or concubinage behind these vague scriptural allusions in the letter. He would have outright put words in the mouth of Joseph Smith, direct more seductive language rather than this theological framework that is in the letter. And I spoke with Brian Hales about his take on this whole thing, and that's one of his main arguments to tie the letter to Joseph Smith. And I agree with him. I think that's an important point to make. Let me just add, Jonathan, that uh, as somebody who practices history professionally on a regular basis, I think that Mormon historians are actually a little bit spoiled (laughs) uh, with the availability of primary documents because, you know, you're giving credit to Garrett saying that uh, if any other document had these provenance problems, we would not take that document seriously. But I actually don't think that's true. I think that in most uh, circles outside of Mormon history, you don't expect to have the original copy of something that gets published. Often you just accept those things sort of at face value because there aren't the kinds of archival systems in place in other realms of history that the Mormons have in place. So I actually think that just the richness of the Mormon documentary record has spoiled people like Garrett a little bit to where they're expecting more from the documentary record than I think most historians would expect. Perfect, perfect. I, uh, I want to ask now, let's talk, spend about five minutes. We've got about maybe 18 minutes left. Um, let's talk for a moment about the Devery Anderson point that there is an earlier reference, contemporary, but we're talking when you know Devery's still alive. He's relatively a young man. I've met him before. And uh, Devery's done a lot of great historical work. And there's this point where he makes a reference to a document in a uh, source called The Law of the Lord, if I'm not mistaken, Maybe run us through that really quick. Well, there's two different kind of missing documents that I've come across. The first one is actually from the biography of Sidney Rigdon. And I think that's Van Wagenen. I can't remember the the author of it. But when you go to his pages about this, if you look at the footnote where he's describing the correspondence between Joseph and Sidney in trying to resolve the conflict, he states that there is a reference that the church has in their archives, which they will not give me access to in the in the book of the law of the Lord of the letters exchanged between them. And, you know, that book was written some time ago. Now that we have the Joseph Smith Papers Project and that book of the law of the Lord is digitized and we can see it, those letters are not there. 
And when you look at the footnote to where those letters would be, it mentions in one of the footnotes that the people at the Joseph Smith Papers projects recalled is that um, those letters are not extant. We don't have those letters. So that's one missing piece of the puzzle of this story. The other thing with Devery Anderson's article, he wrote a really insightful article about Willard Richards' relationship with his first wife as well as with other wives. And because Willard Richards is central to the story, he talks a little bit about the Nancy Rigdon affair. And one of the things he points out is that several Several months before the authorship of the happiness letter, Willard Richards writes back to his wife in Massachusetts, including some of the principles about happiness and these ideas that God is more boundless in his mercies and more liberal. Those things are in those letters. But this is not to say that Willard Richards himself is the author of the happiness letter, but rather that those teachings are part of what Joseph Smith is using to introduce men and women in the inner circle of polygamy to the idea that polygamy can be seen as a justified and righteous thing within the confines of morality. Right. This theology would have been ruminating in all of their heads as Joseph behind the scenes is teaching this, whether you want to call it polygamy, concubine, spiritual wifery concepts. Yeah. And in that article, when he mentions the happiness letter, he refers to a source in the church history with a particular date affixed to it of uh, January 1843 or something like that. And if you just follow his citation and go to the Joseph Smith Papers Project and see if you can find that, I, there's nothing that matches that exactly. And I've asked a number of historians and I've not been able to locate his reference. I sent a note to him, but I haven't heard back from him yet. It's possible that there was a difference in what they were calling particular letter books or something like that when he wrote his article from what we see them now. So I'm, I'm still holding judgment on that. We may be able to find that. If we do locate that, that may be an earlier version of the happiness letter in the records of the church, but it would still just be a transcription of whatever John C. Bennett published in his expose. Gotcha. I guess thoughts from you guys, what other like tangents or other areas do we need to spend a few minutes in? Well, for me, I've spent some time trying to discuss this with defenders of the church as much as possible so I can see what would your objections be to the points that we're raising in, in a presentation like this. One of the unusual ones that I got back was that we are starting with the assumption that Joseph Smith's proposal to Nancy and what is described in the happiness letter involves sex. If we step back and say, let's reimagine what Joseph is proposing, and he's just proposing a ceiling that does not involve sex, then we don't have to be upset or alarmed that it matches the pattern of other sexual predators. I don't know what to say about that because many of the key figures would go on to testify that these proposals involve sex. The history of the church, certainly, and how later prophets uh, practiced polygamy and plural marriage involved sex. So I, I think that's an objection that is helpful to people who really want to preserve a pristine view of Joseph Smith, but I don't think it matches up with the historical record. That doesn't seem... That doesn't seem rational, right? Like we don't lock doors, close windows, and close curtains if we're just talking about uh, a relationship on paper. Um, it, it just seems as though Mormonism is deeply entrenched in trying to keep the Prophet Joseph Smith's reputation squeaky clean when the reality is the evidence seems to indicate that the most rational perspective by far, I think, to an average person who has no stake in the game is that there's sex and propositions of sex all over the place. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the other objection that I've heard is that I was too harsh on Joseph, and I used words like predator, and I shouldn't have done that because Joseph has created some of the most beautiful theological, doctrinal, metaphysical product, and the supernal divine nature of everything else that he did just don't paint him as some sort of lustful, carnal person like I'm depicting him here. And in the presentation, I talk about how when you look at other non-Mormon religious predators, you'll find that in every case, they've had to come up with some religious theological justification to go beyond traditional moral boundaries. And in some cases, it's like a blunt hammer. It's just really, I think David Berger, the children of God says that God said that love is the highest law and we interpret that to be sexual love. And so we're going to share freely sexual love with everybody. And that was his theological justification. Whereas you can look at somebody else like 
David Koresh, who had an intricate justification drawn from the book of Revelation in the Bible, injected with his own prophetic claim to dissolve marriage bonds of everyone and that gave him sexual access to people in his flock. You know, that's more complex than David Berg's. And somebody looking at that might say, well, you know, one of those prophets is right and one of those prophets is wrong, but you really have to engage in special pleading to do that unless you can articulate some argument or justification that is beyond, well, my prophet claims the real authority, that prophet doesn't have the real authority. And really, that's all that you're left with, with Joseph Smith. So I made that argument and the response back is, well, he was just so powerful as a prophet. He, he was a genius. And, and really the thing you have to reflect on is that we have in the history of humanity, creative geniuses who are absolutely brilliant in other parts of their life, who also, by the way, were sexual predators that used these forms of psychological manipulation, isolation, all of these different things to prey upon vulnerable targets. We have Bill Cosby and Michael Jackson recently in the news that when you learn the story of the things that went on there, you can never see them in the same light again because despite their brilliance, there's this dark, hidden aspect of their character which went along with it. And in many cases, it was the power and influence that they wielded because of their genius that gave them access to vulnerable people, and then they could use their position to further basically reveal their character as predators. But it's one of those things where, as a Mormon, you have to confront that this letter exists and then you have to say, why did this letter exist? And that's where you look at all of the history that we've gone over here. And then you really have to ask some searching questions. If this is what Joseph does when he has private access to a woman who is completely in his influence, what does that say about the character of Joseph Smith? And remember, this is right around the time that he is revealing the endowment ceremony. If you accept that this is not a righteous activity and that it would impeach the priesthood of anybody else who claimed priesthood power, then you have to wonder, is the endowment ceremony itself revealed under a righteous priesthood umbrella? He's expounding on the doctrine of baptism for the dead. You know, there's all these different things that are happening in Joseph Smith's religious life at this time, including the publication of the Book of Abraham and all of that. If he is secretly engaged in these things that we are compelled to acknowledge are sexual predations. When we compare them with modern sexual predators, what does it say about his legitimate authority to reveal these other things in his public life? And those are really difficult things, I think, for people who hold a faithful view of Joseph Smith to wrestle with. It becomes easier if you acknowledge that the pattern that he shows in the happiness letter matches other sexual predators other religious charlatans have come up with their own complex theological things that are the product of their genius and not the product of divine revelation from God. Some of them are more successful and long-lasting than others. There's always going to be the one that lasts the longest and has the most success and is able to just strike the right notes and and become a multi-billion dollar corporation. And, and you know, so we just happen to be in one of those groups that has the longest staying power. Yeah, and so two thoughts. One is since the beginning of time, there's been millions of spiritual gurus who have used spiritual manipulation and had lots of sex with lots of women. One. Two is that, well, let me say another part of one, which is you can look within our own tradition, people like Warren Jeffs or James Strang, and you can see that even within Mormonism's breakoffs, the same types of concepts seem to come up over and over again, where one claims authority, one uses uh, creative theological statements, uses it as manipulation, and ends up creating a uh, permission within the culture of having sex with somebody outside of their standard spouse. The second thing is that if you go back into Mormon history and you look at other stories, like, like Nancy Rigdon, this story doesn't just sit isolated in a vacuum. You've got the Lucy Walker story, which I think puts a Sophie's choice in terms of deciding whether you're going to accept a God who changes a relationship, a, a father-daughter into a, a husband-wife type of relationship. You've got the Partridge sisters. You've got other, other stories within Joseph's uh, polygamous partners that indicates that there's serious unhealthiness, there's serious manipulation, there's serious abuse of women who are young and vulnerable and putting pressure of time limits on them. When you dive into Mormonism's history outside the correlated curriculum, 
you begin to sense like, wow, this gets deeply unhealthy, deeply problematic. And Joseph Smith, it's, it's impossible for him to escape squeaky clean. Yeah, absolutely. And you brought up some good examples. I think Emily Partridge in particular, the fact that she later testified that at exactly this time, early 1842, Joseph Smith offered to write her a letter about some secret thing that would place him at risk, but she would have to promise to burn it afterwards. That's an affirmation of the Nancy Rigdon story. And it also speaks to the the messy dangerousness of having this man wield this power and use it against these vulnerable people. You know, when you listen to people like Brian Hales and other defenders of the church, one of their most common defenses of polygamy, like Brian Hales, I think, no longer defends polygamy as a practice in general. Like he doesn't say that it was a glorious thing for the women involved, but that it was from Joseph Smith. One of the common defenses is that, well, it's not just about sex and lust. It's about binding families and sealing families and all of these different theological things. And we just step back and you say, that no longer removes my concern because every one of these religious charlatans had some sort of theological excuse. That does not sublimate it. That does not make him not a predator. It's the nature of the manipulations, the secrecy, the undue influence, the ecclesiastical abuse that is part of the messaging of of all of these things. Those things paint the picture of the predator regardless of everything else. If God really wanted to have bindings and sealings and power, if he couldn't find a way to do it in an ethical way that respected the autonomy and the individual free choice of people, then there's a problem there. And that concept of free choice and what you see in the happiness letter and what happened to Nancy Rigdon after when she talked about it is another problem for the church because Brian C. Hale's will say frequently that uh, Joseph Smith did not impose this on anyone. Women were free to reject him. And what he doesn't tell you is that they are free to reject him as long as they stay quiet about it. If they go public about it, as Nancy did here, then they are subject to reprisal. And everything that Chris talked about in terms of how Sidney Rigdon's family, Nancy Rigdon in particular, was dragged through the mud, that is a pattern of reprisal, which again, you find in other religious sexual predators when people go and talk about what's happening in their secret practice they get punished within the group. And so all of these things come together as we learn more about how predators work by studying other groups. And then we go back and reflect on what is happening in the early church. We realize that as long as men have desired sex, as long as men have held power over women, as long as people have had reverence and devotion to God and imbued implicit trust to men claiming to speak for God, that there have been predators who have exploited that for their own gratification. And we just happen to have really good documentation of it. Yeah. I think sometimes Mormonism, the the thing it did the worst or the thing Joseph Smith did that really hurt him the most was trying to be a record keeping people. Um, I think once you look in the documents, Mormonism really struggles to hold up when you look at it with objectivity. To the two of you, I've got three minutes left. Uh, any final thoughts from you guys before we close this out? I, uh, I just want to quote a couple of things from the trial record of uh, the men who were, you know, the John C. Bennett trial, the men who were uh, tried by the church for approaching women with sexual overtures. A couple of these women actually asked the men, why is Joseph Smith teaching publicly something else if he's teaching you this privately? And William answered Catherine Fuller that Joseph was obliged to teach to the contrary on the stand to keep down prejudice and to keep peace at home. And Chauncey Higby told Sarah Miller that Joseph now taught as he did in public through necessity on account of the prejudices of the people and his own family particularly as they had not become full believers in the doctrine. So pretty explicit evidence that I think answers the Joseph fought polygamy people who really point to Joseph Smith's public teachings as his true teaching. I think the people very close to him, including his brother William, make very clear that his public teaching was not his true teaching. It was his private teaching that really reflected his his private views. That's a good point. Uh, For me, I would just say if you're an apologist and you're listening to this podcast, you should immediately abandon any efforts to try to preserve the happiness letter as coming from Joseph Smith. You should take Derek Gertmott's letter, approve it for publication in the interpreter and any other thing and run with that. Get as far away from the happiness letter as possible. Introduce as much fear, doubt, uncertainty as possible into the origin of it and throw every general authority, whoever quoted it in general conference under the bus, because that's 
way better than tying it to Joseph Smith. Wow. Yeah. And I'm with you. The Mormonism I grew up with uh, as a young adult uh, was so gorgeous and beautiful, but I stuck in some ways. I mean, I knew some of the issues, but I also accepted whole cloth, the correlated story. Once I dove deeper into who Joseph Smith was and all of these behind the scenes comments and then tracing all these quotes back to journals and other historical documents, suddenly my view of Joseph Smith uh, deeply changed. And so I'm with you, Jonathan. They've got to they're going to have to distance themselves from this or just not deal with it at all, because if you accept this letters from Joseph and you understand the story behind it, you deal with the uh, Lucy Walker story, you deal with the Partridge sister story. It's more than just the apologist saying like, yeah, you know, he was fallible. He made some mistakes. What we have is what you point out, which is a, a predator, somebody who is deeply manipulative, somebody who finds young women who are vulnerable, even in a lot of the times working in his own home and abused his power in order to get things that he wanted from these women, including sex. And I think it just gets really messy for anybody who wants to study this stuff with any level of sincerity. Um, I want to say thank you to both of you. Uh, appreciate it so much. There will be a ton of links for the listener on the end of this episode. So if you go to the show notes at the website, mormondiscussionpodcast.org, and you'll see the show notes there, we will link everything we've talked about. You can see the documentation, the the source notes for those. And I hope that this episode's been interesting, although I don't think it's going to be pleasant for anybody who's trying to wrestle with Mormonism. Thank you to both of you uh, and appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Bill.